So, the trailer for the new Pokemon game, Scarlet and Violet, came out about a week ago. The video is beautiful, the animation and gameplay look amazing, and of course, the Pokemon are awesome. Inspired by this, I, the effects artist, wanted to show my excitement for the new games by taking one of my favorite Pokemon from the new trailer and bringing it to life with animation. This wasn't my first time bringing something to reality, so I believed it would be, you know, a fun little project that I could just create and upload with no underlying issues. But dear God, was I wrong. Yeah, the title you read wasn't clickbait, the result is awful. There are glitches, tracking errors, texture problems, it's just, oh, it's just so bad. The only reason I'm still making this video is because I set a deadline for myself and I'm five days too deep to turn back on this now. So if you enjoy my suffering, would you mind hitting the like button and the subscribe please? I'd really appreciate it because God, everything just went bad in this video. Apparently, less than 1% of the people that watch my videos are actually subscribed, which, I mean, makes sense considering I only have 128 subscribers. Who I love and appreciate. I really love the support. So, without further ado, let's see how this train wreck started. It all started with me finding a 3D model of my current favorite Pokemon from the new games, Fue Coco. I chose Fue Coco because, like, why not? They're so adorable and stupid looking. Like, there is not a single thought going through that brain other than, ah. Uh... And yes, he's better than Lechonk, fight me. Anyway, I found the 3D model on Sketchfab for like seven bucks, got it, downloaded it, and dropped it into Blender where all of the problems started coming. The first issue I encountered was rigging. For the people who don't know, rigging is basically creating controls for animators to animate. The rig determines how the model moves, so it's very important to make a good rig if you want a good animation. There is only one issue. I don't know how to rig anything. Okay. How to do IK rigging blender. Yeah, you see, usually I use something like Rigify or Mixamo, which automates the rigging process for me. However, those usually require something that is human or animal shaped. Fue Coco is neither human nor animal shaped, so I have to rig the entire model myself. But you know, I just have to, you know, look up a YouTube video, follow the steps, learn a thing or two about what rigging is, understand bones, uh, IK, FK, uh, figure out how different control points work, how organizing all the bones on a certain axis works. Uh, how to figure out how to connect the bones so that they can move in a conjoined fashion. How hard could that be? Really hard. This took me four hours of real time just to figure out how any of this worked, and still more time just to, you know, actually break the character that I was supposed to break. It was a painful process, and my computer crashed multiple times while I was working on it, but I actually got it done and had a fully rigged Fuego. I'm sorry, what? Dude, like, speak up. I can't, I can't hear what you're saying. What do you mean that was the easy part? Since I worked so much on the rig, I decided to go to sleep and take care of the rest the next day. The next day came and it got much, much worse. The next thing I needed to do was texture the model. You see, when models are made, they're just blank. There's no color, reflections, any of that. To give Fue Coco the skin color and stuff it needs, I need to texture it. Now, you'll notice when looking back at when I bought the model, it looks like the texture is already there. The color and stuff is alright, so I just need to modify it to make it look more realistic. But, um, I'm not very forward thinking, which is definitely a pattern in this video. And I didn't check to see if the texture even came with the model that I bought. It didn't. So that means I have to paint all the textures from scratch. Yay! Here's a fact, just like with rigging, I don't know how to paint textures. So of course, I tried to learn it myself, and thankfully it was not as complicated as rigging. No, my problems didn't come from any of that. It was far, far more annoying. I painted the texture using reference images from Google so I could get the exact color and placement of the texture. It was all going really well, but then my computer crashed. I lost the entire texture I was working on, but it's fine. Because, you know, did it once, I could do it again. I crashed a second time. Okay, well, third time's a charm. Forgot to save the image. <sighs> okay, just one more. Accidentally deleted it. Well, I, I, ju I just want to crash again. <laughs> yep, it took five separate tries just to paint the base color for this texture. I hadn't even gotten to making it look realistic yet. But I powered through, and a lot of time later, I finally had the texture and use details from a realistic reptile texture I found to make Fuecoco look more real. 
By the end, it looked like this, and I was feeling pretty confident in how the project was going. But hey, if you check the time on this video, you can see we're only about five minutes through. Why does it... Why does it look like he, like, just... He just murdered someone in cold blood. This seems like a really good time for an intermission, so let's go outside. You know, going outside, that thing you never do. But why go out there, you ask? The reason is simple. We're getting footage. Usually this is the part in my description where I say, oh, but this thing screwed up, oh, but it got so much worse. But actually, it went perfectly fine. I went to my backyard and just recorded myself walking around a corner a few times. I recorded all the footage with my iPhone and then took a 360 image of where I planned to have Fue Coco standing. The process was peaceful and honestly quite relaxing. So now, back to your regularly scheduled chaos. For animation, there's a lot of different sections of it that I had to go through. Basically, there's a decent amount of setup process that I had to do before I actually got to animating Fue Coco. I want to see if I could rapid fire all of these off real quick. So ready? Three, two, one. First wave tracking, where we take our footage and load it up in After Effects, slap an effect on it so it can do its thing and we can figure out where the camera is and how it moves. Boom, done. Next, we render the footage and bring it along with the animated camera into Blender, where we can very quickly recreate the footage with basic geometry. Boom, next. We then use the footage to project the texture onto the newly made geometry and change the geometry into a shadow capture so that it can do exactly that. And then also has all the reflections and other stuff that we need for our model to interact with the scene around it. Boom, loud exclamation. <sighs> so we did that. And now we're on to the actual animation of the character. This step in the process of making this video was always going to be one of the most difficult for me. Unlike the first two steps, I actually can animate things, I just don't have much of an inclination for it. Animation takes a lot of practice and work to learn, and since I do animation along with everything else in my videos, I don't really get the practice I need to be good at animating things. Because of this, I usually end up using preset animations a lot, so when I realized I had to animate about 600 frames of this dumb little crocodile moving around, I kind of gave up. The realization I had about the amount of work I had to do with this video became overwhelming because I still had lighting, rendering, compositing, and editing to do for the final product. It was at this point, four days in, that I realized the project I was working on wouldn't come out well. Based on everything I had made so far, I realized that it just wouldn't be up to the same standard as my other works. It's very annoying when you know you put so much work into something and you're already prepared for it to come out looking like garbage. This completely discouraged me to the point where I waited 12 hours to even start animating Fue Coco just because I was so upset. I didn't feel that I should even continue the project anymore. It was after that 12 hour period where I kinda just sat down and pressed on anyway. I don't know if it was just stubborn determination or the fact that I had already put 4 days of work into the video already, but I didn't want to give up for no reason. It was at exactly that moment where I remembered the magical world of animation modifiers. Animation modifiers let me use math to automate animation. For example, if I use the noise modifier at the end of Fue Coco's tail, I can make it wag. This realization, along with me rewatching One Punch Man, got me through a lot of the animation process. And about six hours later, I had this. Okay, it's still not good, but it's something, all right? With all of that completed, I now just had to light the scene so it looked realistic and then render out the animation. I used the 360 degree image that I got from outside to get the best lighting possible. Then I hit render and went to sleep, prepared for a new day. We are finally near the end of the project. By this point, I know it won't look good, but I don't expect it to. It was around this time that I got the idea to make this video about how bad the process was, so I was a bit more motivated to finish this hellfire of a project. So, the next step is compositing. Compositing is the final step of visual effects when you put all of your assets together into one video. Compositing is actually my best skill, so I didn't really have any problems with this. All I had to do was bring in my footage, put the rendered out version of Fue Coco onto the footage with the right timing, add a shadow catcher, color Fue Coco to match the scene, rotoscope, which is just cutting out and layering parts of the footage over other things, the barrel and my hand in the shot so they cover Fue Coco, 
and render out the whole video. Pretty simple, right? Yes, yes it is. So why did this take me a whole day to do? To be fair, rotoscoping takes a lot of time, but the big issue came in rendering, but I'll hold off explaining that until the end. Lastly, I added it a bit into the video to make it more fun and changed the overall color of the video and then exported it. So now, the moment you've been waiting for, without further ado, the final video I made, the live action Fue Coco. I just, I found something crazy outside. Let, let me, let me just show you this. Let me just show you this right here. Where, 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 where is it? Hey there, little buddy. Hey, how you doing? Yeah, it's just, just me. Just me, all right. Oh my God. Look, this is, this is absolutely wild. Hey, 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 hey. Hey man, I'm just, oh, okay. That's fine, that's fine. It's cool, we all cool here. What on earth is that? Our little boy looks like he glitched through the matrix. And don't get me started on this weird freaking hand thing that's going on. I honestly have no clue if everyone else sees it as bad as I do, but here's another video of mine that I made about half a year ago for a comparison. Bum, 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 ba -dum, ba -dum. A duck walked up to a lemonade stand and he said to the man running the stand, Hey, bum, 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 got any grapes? It's literally better in every way, and I made it half a year ago. It seriously annoys me how bad the Fue Coco video came out. Okay, but now for the explanation. The video is obviously glitched out. This has actually happened multiple times with my projects, and I can't always control it. However, I can attempt to re-render and fix it, but instead of doing that, I put myself on a time crunch in order to get this video out, and so I left the glitches in. Combine that with weird floaty animation and wrinkly skin texture, and you have yourself one heaping helping of a trash video. <sighs> So what do I do now? I don't want to post a video on Instagram or TikTok like I usually do because I just don't like it. I found that the best course of action was to retrace my steps. That's what the video you're currently watching is. I wanted to look back at this crazy process just to see exactly what happened and what went wrong. The answer? It was a big mix of me not thinking ahead or paying attention, as well as my computer wanting to bug out and die on me. That could probably also be blamed on me too, since I had YouTube, OBS, and animation softwares all running at the exact same time. I have a strong computer, but not that strong, I guess. On the good side, I did actually teach myself how to rig a model, as well as the basics of texture painting. And honestly, I think that's the best message for this video. While I may have made an honestly awful product, I did learn a lot while I was making it. I learned new skills in my field, I learned to push through and set myself to a deadline, which I usually never do. I also learned to make an entire content-filled video about my failures. I hope that anyone who sees this video can learn from my mistakes, and also learns that it's okay to make mistakes of their own, and to push through those mistakes because then you can learn more from the process. Experience is experience, whether it be good or bad. So yeah, my name's Elias of Elias Productions. This video is awful, so please watch it. <sighs> Elias Log. It has been half a year since I started my journey through analog horror. Things I've seen and the stories that I've heard, well, let's just say it isn't called horror for no reason. I myself have made five of my own videos. I find it fascinating, but from the outside looking in, it looks crazy. But I'm not crazy. You're crazy. I'm, I'm, I'm not crazy. You're crazy. I'm not crazy. You're crazy. I'm not crazy. You're crazy. <laughs> Okay, if you told me half a year ago that I would be five episodes deep in a self-made web series similar to that of the Walton Files and Mandela catalog, I probably would have questioned my sanity, but here we are anyway. If you have no clue what I'm talking about, I have a five episode web series on my YouTube channel known as Anomaly Report. The series takes inspiration from things like The Backrooms and Five Nights at Freddy's, all 80s era type analog horror. And of course, because I'm me, I had to add entirely original characters, enemies, monsters, and all of the like. It only recently occurred to me that I've been doing this for half a year now. So I wanted to take a quick break and do a bit of a retrospective on the entire series. Just what I've learned from the entire process and what I hope to do in the future with it. So, uh, let's get into it, shall we? The first video I made in the series was Anomaly Report. Side note, the video wasn't named that at first, but it changed later and we'll get into that later in the video. And it was made entirely on a whim. 
I made the first video after seeing a bunch of backrooms and analog horror type content and just wanting to try to recreate it myself. I made the video to be some kind of backrooms alternate universe type story with my own original characters and things happening. It was all just for fun and I didn't really plan to make anything else based off it anyway, so I just put it together and then uploaded it to YouTube. I also want to note that at this time I was barely uploading to YouTube. I only uploaded every few months and the videos that I uploaded were not always the best. They were always just short compilations of other things that I'd worked on. After making the first episode, I showed it to a couple of my friends and they all said that they liked it. So why not continue it? The second episode of the series was the episode that really got me hyper fixated on making these. The second episode was called AAA Application Form and it was the episode that I really started to focus in on what the story was. I had a whole lot more dialogue, different points of views from different characters, and it was all put together into one video that I was really proud of. The video became the most popular of the series, gaining over 300 views. And for a channel that only had around 100 subscribers at the time, that was a lot. But then, something happened that became my entire motivation for continuing the series all through the rest of the summer. About a day after uploading the second video, I was scrolling through Twitter where I saw someone comment on the promotion post I made for the episode. It's since been deleted, but someone on Twitter added me about a Reddit page that was talking about my series. Now at this time, I had never used Reddit or even made an account, so I was very confused. Turns out someone had made an entire Reddit page dedicated to solving the ciphers and riddles that were thrown throughout my entire series. The Reddit page was named r slash anomaly report, and the moment I heard that, I knew it had to be the name for the actual series. So to the person that made that Reddit page, thank you so much, it really inspired me to keep making the series, and also you basically named it, so thank you very much. I was so excited just from seeing that Reddit page that once I got back from college, the first thing I did was get on my computer and get back to work on the third episode. More characters, more story, less monsters surprisingly, but either way, the third episode was me just trying all of the different possibilities. Because it was the summer, I had a lot more time to focus in on a lot of different details, specifically with the visual and audio editing of the series. I tried out so many different things that looking back on it, it actually isn't as good as the second episode in my opinion. I just did a bit too much and it got a bit convoluted and some of the ideas I added in just weren't really that good. While I still like the episode, there's a lot of things that I realized I probably just shouldn't have done, but I was too excited, could you blame me? It was after making this episode that I realized I should probably slow down on this type of content I was making. It was fun to make an anime, but doing the same thing over and over again gets boring for anybody, no matter what it is. During my break from Analog Horror, I decided to make two different types of videos, one more story driven and one more content and commentary driven. The story driven one has since been deleted because I just don't really like it anymore. But the commentary one was actually the first Give Me Views video, so you can go watch that if you want to see the hellfire that that video was. So after having a bit of fun with those, I decided to finally go back to making more Anomaly Report. And when I tell you, th this one was cool. The next video in the series was titled Family and Friend. I was still kind of working on it, but by this point, I kind of had a formula for how I was making these videos. Each video had at least one fully animated segment of CG animation, usually edited together with images or text related to the story. Sometimes I would also have message logs just being read out by an auto reader in the video. I'd put it all together and slap some creepy static audio on top of it, and then boom, it would be done. The only difference that happened in Family and Friend was the inclusion of actual live action footage of myself and me using actual hand-done 3D animation. You see, usually in the videos, I would find preset animations that I would apply to the models and monsters that I created, then animate the camera around those motions so I could have a decently believable scene. This time, however, I got a bit more ambitious. I created this monster eye lady thing. Side note, but I actually didn't design this monster. It was designed by my friend, a writerly user on Instagram. She's really great and also designed even more monsters for this series, so I really couldn't have made a lot of it without her. She's awesome. And then decided to fully animate it myself. This was basically my first time animating a character in like a year, so I was kinda stressed out about it. But turns out, when you're making horror, you can get away with a lot more animation mistakes than you would think. That's actually an important point, but we'll put a pin in that for later. So it turns out that the animation that I did for that episode actually came out looking really good. It was creepy and distorted, and it gave the exact type of feeling that I was going for in that scene. After uploading that video, I decided to take one more quick break before getting on to the last video of the series that I've made so far. The final episode was called Anomaly Report number 66, and it was a doozy. Now we've heard characters talk throughout this series, but we've never really heard them speak normally. The only time that's happened is in the second episode, and this is now the fifth. 
I realized that for an audience, it's kind of weird to not have any characters to really relate or grab onto while watching the series, so I decided to focus more in on that. It was basically on this episode that I decided to really focus in on my main character, Damien. I literally just sat in front of Mike and just kind of started talking while watching through my animation, just making sure I matched myself up to what was going on. Turns out, this worked really well. That, and along with the fact that this episode had two fully CG animations instead of just the usual one that I add per video. This episode really encapsulated everything I wanted the series to be. The main character was, at least in my opinion, sarcastic and realistic enough to be pretty enjoyable and relatable. There were two monsters in this episode rather than just one, and it was really fun to create their interactions with the main character. And of course, because it's me, it was also full of a bunch of references and clues and things to solve. I finished that video and then just decided to take a full break before getting back into it once I was back in college. Of course, now that I actually am back in college, I decided to look back and just think, what should I do with this series? I was so focused on going episode to episode that I wasn't really sure about the overall picture I was trying to create with the series. So of course, now that I'm looking back on it, what should I do? And how should I do it? The answer I have so far is this. I really love making Anomaly Report, and since I don't have any artistic classes this semester, I really need the outlet to be able to just make whatever I want and have fun with it. I also want to continue because when it comes to making a series like this, I realize that I can get away with so many more mistakes than I could making any other type of project. As a VFX artist, things like very small minor mistakes could really make or break a shot turning something that's supposed to look realistic into something that really just takes you out of the story entirely. Because of this, I get very scared to do long-form type projects that require lots of work and animation just in case I make that tiny little error and it ruins the entire video. It's like when you're watching a movie and then something on the scene doesn't track right and then you realize that it's been edited and it just takes you out of the whole film. That scares me, so doing any project that's more than 20 seconds is very, very difficult. However, when making analog horror, you realize that a lot of the things that are usually considered mistakes in visual effects and animation can actually be bonuses when you're making a horror series. In analog horror, things are supposed to be glitchy, messy, and not match up right. Audio is meant to cut out randomly and just not work the way it's supposed to. In a way, analog horror is like a very good easy step into making long form content for me. Mainly because if I make a mistake in my series, that's okay it can actually even make the video better than it was before. A frequent problem that I sometimes run into is whenever I'm rendering an animation, sometimes the render will break and things will just glitch out and distort everywhere. In Anomaly Report, I'm not scared of that. In fact, I invite it to happen. It hasn't yet, but if it does, I'd be glad to incorporate that into the video. Now, of course, this isn't just me trying to make an excuse to be able to screw around and not make high quality content. I'm still very focused on the story, and even with glitches and mistakes happening, there's still things that I'd want to go back and fix in my series. There's also the issue of the fact that I recently switched softwares. When I first started Anomaly Report, my main softwares were Blender 3D, After Effects, and Premiere Pro. Recently, I've thrown After Effects and Premiere entirely out the window in replace of DaVinci Resolve. I'm still learning this new software. In fact, you should have seen how long it took me just to figure out how to record this audio. So with all that in mind, what do I do? Well, here's the plan for now. You may notice that in the Anomaly Report series playlist that I have on my YouTube channel, there's only one video in there currently. All the videos I've made for Anomaly Report are still on my channel, they're just no longer a part of the playlist. Instead, what I've decided to do is to remake all of the episodes within my new software. I'm doing this to make sure that the story I have is a lot more cohesive, and that all the videos generally have the same look and feel to them. That, and also, it's actually really good practice with learning my new software, since I already have all the animated clips set up and ready to work with. I'll be remaking each episode until I can finally get up to the point where I have to make a new episode for the series. By the time that happens, we'll just have to see where we're at and see if I still want to continue making this series. Though either way, I'm really excited to continue this project. I think it's going to be a lot of fun, and I hope everyone really enjoys it. So with that out of the way, I'm Elias of Elias Entertainment, and I made an analog horror series. Please watch it. No, you know what? Screw it. I spent the past two videos in this series talking about the struggles I have making content. Ooh, this video sucks and I'm upset. Aw, I spent half a year making horror and now I'm going through a midlife crisis. Me, 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 me. I'm done with all that. Screw it. We're just going to feed my ego today, so roll the intro. <laughs> All 
Alright, you heard me from 10 seconds ago, we're doing this. For this Give Me Views video, we're just gonna talk about how great I am, and you're gonna watch it because that's the title. Look, and it's not like the other videos are bad. Showing off my mistakes just gives me the chance to teach other people how to avoid the same problems that I face. However, in order to make a series out of that, you have to, you know, make more mistakes. And sometimes instead of pointing out my flaws, I just want to talk about how great I am. Like, am I perfect? No, but I'm gonna show off when I get the chance, so that's what we're doing. I'm just gonna go over some of my favorite videos, some of even my viral hits that I just really enjoy, and talk about how I made them and why they're so good. And also the duck thing. Well, uh, we'll get to the duck thing eventually. So now, time to boast about myself in front of a microphone and a computer screen. Because that's what sane people do. Let's talk about the most popular video I've ever made in my career so far, and that's Newt Newt. If you don't know what Newt Newt is, it's basically this meme that came out of this TV show character called Pingu? Pingu? Pingus? That, that was way too close. Ah, uh, I'm getting demonetized. Whatever the name is, basically this character would just kind of walk around and just make this random sound. <laughs> you know, it's just like, adorable. There was a meme going around with it, and I'll just show you what it was real quick, just right. And I wanted to recreate it, so that was basically the plan. Copy the meme, but add a bit of my, you know, VFX flavor to it. I ended up wanting to recreate it with stop motion CG animation. This was a technique I had already used before, so it was something I could easily recreate along with testing out something different with my new software. That new thing was the Asus color space. And I just realized I'm gonna have to explain what that is, so, um... Here we go really fast! So, first things first, what is a color space? A color space or color profile is basically a name that describes how much light and color information is in a picture or video. For example, anything recorded with a normal iPhone or with a web camera is usually recorded in Rec. 709 color space. Rec. 709 is just the usual color space that most things use, I don't know what it actually means, but yeah. And this color space determines basically how bright and dark a video can get, and also basically how much the colors pop in that video as well. So as a VFX artist, color space is extremely important. Important. When adding any CGI to footage, knowing and matching the color space makes it 10 times more easier to make the CG look like it actually was recorded in the actual scene. Basically, knowing your color space and being able to match it just makes CGI and all those things look 10 times better. For example, this is what CGI looks like when you don't match the color space, and this is what it looks like when you do. There are more details to it, but we'll get to that in a different video. Moving on! So now you know what color space is, so what is ACES? Well, ACES is another color space, just like Rec. 709. However, this is how much color data that Rec. 709 can hold, and this is how much data ACES can hold. Obviously, one of these holds more than the other. And when you have more color and light data, you have a lot more space to match CG and footage together into one shot. So while of course I made the new new video for fun, it was also a chance for me to test out using ACES to mix CG and live action footage. So with that in mind, here's how I actually made the shot. First, I recorded my footage and got a 360 image of everything around the shot. I took that footage, tracked it, and sent it off to Blender. Yes, my room was a mess, don't worry about it. In Blender, I made a basic floor plane for the scene and then made my 3D model, Pingu. Isn't he so adorable? I'm proud of this model, I think he's cute. Once the model was ready, I gave him a texture that I had from an... older project that you totally shouldn't watch. I then rigged the model and animated it so it would do the whole newt newt thing. Once that was done, I rendered it out and layered it on top of the original footage. I changed my color space in my software to aces so that I could then match everything together. And lastly, I edited the clip so that it would look more like the meme, and then finally, I had this. A shot like this, I wouldn't think much of. The only thing really different about this project compared to others was that I was using aces, and it worked really well. The color and shadows look great, the animation looks fun, and the meme is done. I created a vertical version of the video to upload to TikTok and Instagram, and then went to take a shower or something. I come out of the shower, and the video has 10,000 views! To this day, I have no clue why that video blew up, it's currently sitting at 75,000 views right now. It is the most viewed thing I've ever created, except for one thing that I deleted a long time ago. To this day, I don't know why it blew up, but it's really cool that it did. And because of that, it became one of my favorite videos throughout my whole career. Next, let's talk about my work that's just pure animation. Now, I know you might be a bit confused, like, isn't everything I do animation? Technically, yes, but there are two categories that I usually fall into. One is visual effects or VFX, and the other is CG animation. 
Visual effects usually refers to the mixing of computer generated images along with live action footage. So while there is CG animation, it is combined with live action stuff in some way. Of course there are some scenes like in Marvel movies or big budget films that are entirely CG but still considered VFX so it, it, it get confusing. CG animation is mostly defined by lots of different 3D works. CGI just means computer generated images but it's usually used when referring to 3D stuff. So you can kind of say 3D animation or CG animation and most of the time it means the same thing. When I say CG or 3D animation, I'm just going to be referring to the stuff that I make that is only animated and has no other live action footage in it. Except when it does, because that, I don't know, and none of it makes sense. One of the first clips that I made that I really liked was me, Little Nightmares. Little fact about me, but Little Nightmares is one of my favorite games of all time. When I first saw it, I thought it was cool, but the more I get into it, the more I just love everything around it. I love the style of it, the world building, the thrilling gameplay, like everything is just, ah, it's great. Honestly, I could talk about it for hours, but that's for a different video. The important thing is that I was so obsessed with Little Nightmares that I even created my own original character for it. The Little Nightmares main characters have a weird kind of numbering system going on with their names, so I decided to name mine me, but spelled M3, because, you know, I'm quirky like that. Using this character I created, along with 3D models of the other main characters of the series, I put them together to kind of make a Little Nightmares inspired animation that just kind of looked cool for me. I put it all together in like a day, it wasn't the most complicated thing, but oh, it looks so good. I even added some like cool music like, here just watch it. And cool thing is that this isn't even the only video I've made with these characters. There's also this one right here. And this one that I think looks really cool. I could gush about this for a while, but it really seems that Little Nightmares just brings out the best work in me for some reason. Well, uh, that and one other thing. I admittedly was dreading having to get onto this topic, but if we're here, we might as well do it. Let's talk about the duck. Now, as an artist who posts on YouTube, Instagram, and TikTok and all that, of course, views and likes matter to me. I don't want to say like I'm obsessed with numbers or anything, but of course, I'm going to look at my statistics and see how my growth is going on the internet. I do this because what I'm doing right now is really fun and I really want to turn it into an actual sustainable job, so of course looking at the numbers is going to be important. Now I think I can speak for all artists when I say this, but no matter how much work we put into something, we have absolutely no clue what's going to pop off on the internet most of the time. The best artists can really do is follow trends and usually relate to that because of how long it takes to, you know, create art in some sort of way. I know as an animator, whenever I see a meme and want to create a little joke based off of it, I have to make it really fast or else the entire meme is just going to disappear before I even get to finish. This makes doing things like blowing up or getting consistent views a bit difficult, especially because most platforms promote posting a lot and artists just can't do that. Like I'm seriously envious of like gaming and vlog YouTubers and TikTokers who can just post constantly each day, it's amazing. Meanwhile, I create an animation a week and sometimes not even that if I'm working on a big project. But either way, the point I'm trying to make is that numbers matter, at least in some respect. So when looking at statistics, it's good to find things that people enjoy that will consistently get me views. Using that, I can continue making that content that people like and just continue growing my platform, right? Well, that would be true if the internet made any sense about what they liked about my content. You see, there happens to be a very specific type of video that consistently gets much higher views than any of my other content. This even transcends platforms. It doesn't matter if I'm posting on Twitter, YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, whatever. It consistently gets higher views than almost everything I've ever made. The only time this hasn't been true is videos like Newt Newt where it just goes viral for absolutely no reason. I'm going to show you a few of these videos and I'm just going to see if you can guess the through line between these. Did you see it? No? Oh, hold on, I, I can make a... 
a little clear. It's the giant duck with robot legs. If you're not a 3D artist, then you probably have no idea where this came from, but let me explain real quick. This beautiful monstrosity that you see before you is known as the Quacken. The model was created by this guy, Obi One, who's a VFX artist and CG animator, just like I am. Something amazing about artist communities is that people have a tendency to make things and then just share it with everyone else for entirely free. And as long as you credit the original person who created it, you can just use it for whatever you want. When I first saw that, I was like, oh, I gotta try this, so I immediately went and downloaded the model. Because I was so new and still learning things about 3D animation, it was actually really useful to have something like this, and it helped me learn a lot about how to animate and how to just work with that pipeline. The model is very beginner friendly, and I suggest using it to anyone who wants to start using 3D animation. It's a good practice tool. But for some reason, and I can't figure out why, whenever I make a video featuring the Quacken, it becomes one of the most popular videos I make that month. Don't believe me? Well, those four videos that I showed you, yeah, those all together equal to about 20,000 views. And that's not even counting the amount of times that this video for some reason got reposted by a bunch of different art pages on Instagram. Gaining another 15,000 views overall. This even happened on my YouTube channel. Obviously, YouTube has never been my breadwinner when it comes to media. Instagram and TikTok will always hold that candle with videos just kind of going viral randomly. On YouTube, I usually average around 40 to 50 views. Sometimes it reaches to 100 and 200 if it gets a little special treatment, but that's about it. But lo and behold, I post one video of the duck, and what happens? 2,000 views. This is my most viewed YouTube video. I've made an entire analog horror series and i've made this series multiple videos over 10 minutes nope 18 second video of a robot duck that that's that's what people want and i know i sound salty but like it's just an odd thing to see that like for some reason this duck is just what makes it it's the key to everything! You need something to brighten up your day and make you happy? Put a quacken in it. You have a life-threatening disease? Well, let me show you this quacken and you'll be all better. Note that quacken does not solve any physical ailments. If you feel ill or have any pain or discomfort, please contact your local physician and not a giant duck robot. This message brought to you by the Elias Federation of Quacken Equality. We're not your doctors. Again, it's not like I'm saying any of this is bad. I'm just fascinated because like, why this? What, what about the duck makes it so interesting and so much better than like all the other content that I make? I don't know, maybe it's more of like a personal problem. I think other artists can relate to this problem where we sometimes make something just for fun that's kind of ridiculous and dumb, and it completely outshines all of the other work that we actually put effort into. And I really understand that I probably shouldn't get upset about this, but I wasn't kidding when I said it makes me think about what am I possibly doing wrong? Is there something I'm missing that everyone else is seeing? I feel like as an artist, I'm kind of blinded when it comes to my own work. I just kind of create something and think it's amazing, and then when I put it out, of course, I can be proven wrong. Not in a bad way, mind you, just in a way that like, oh, I realized these mistakes and I couldn't really see that while I was creating it. Especially with the duck videos, I can notice that there are quite a few extremely visible mistakes. In fact, while they do look good, there are also things about them that irk me so bad that I honestly don't want to see them again sometimes. An interesting thing to me is that people honestly don't care sometimes about that. It doesn't matter how flawed or odd the video is people just like seeing the duck. And then it's reversed for things that I'm really proud of. Like, how many of you have seen this hummingbird video I made? Comment down below if you've seen it before this video, like, I'm actually curious. This is one of my most recent animations, and truly, I believe that this is one of the best things I've ever created so far in my career. But because of, you know, like, the algorithm and everything, not many people saw it. But hey, if I ever need views, I could just use the quacken, right? Like, doesn't that just sound wrong? Like, I don't really want to be just, like, working and farming for views. I want to make content that I'm proud of and proud to show other people. But at the same time, my goal is to entertain people, and if people just want to see the duck, Shouldn't I just do that? It's probably a self-centered question. And to be fair, this whole video has been very self-centered. I'm just stuck between wanting these two things within a pipe dream of actually becoming famous with my content. They both inspire me to create and hinder my creation at the same time. I haven't fully figured this out yet, but you can tell me your thoughts down below in the comments if you want. I'd love to hear the advice. Especially if you're Queen Aqua from my YouTube comment section. I'm just mentioning them because like they're so nice and they give me the sweetest comments. Even with what I said at the beginning of the video, I guess I still started talking about my struggles when it comes to making content. Eh, I still fed my ego, so I think it's alright. But yeah, with uh, that out of the way, I guess I've been Elias of Elias Entertainment. And I make some pretty good videos sometimes. Please watch them. <sighs> hey man, what you watching? Uh, just morning news stuff, you know. I, I got you, cool. <laughs>
<laughs> well, that concludes our information on why crocodiles shouldn't exist. Moving on, we have a recent discovery from our local scientists. Local scientists, thank you, soon-to-be-fired news anchor. You can find multiple studies on this issue online, but to sum it up, you have to blah 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 blah. Can you understand a single word this guy is saying? Not at all. I think it's something about the mitochondria being the powerhouse of the cell. I was thinking more a squared plus b squared equals c squared. No, that's the platypus's dichotomy. I'm pretty sure this is the Gettysburg Address. No, I'm pretty sure- Okay, dear lord, you already get the joke. We're just gonna move on from this bit. The world of science is an ever-evolving, ever-changing, boundless field of study that is one of the most consequential and terrifying things to understand and one of the most confusing topics ever put to man. And I want to talk about it. Now, before we get into anything, I do want to note that this video is a school assignment. I have a class I'm currently taking that's kind of about the sociology and ethics of science, and this is actually my final assignment for that class. I know that's a weird thing to point out, but trust me, wait till the end of the video, there's a reason that I told you that. And even though it's a school assignment, I'm still very interested in the topic, and the format of the video is still gonna be the exact same. So without further ado, let's get started on why I hate science. Do the thing! Like any good essay, video essay, or internet tirade, I have a thesis that I want to explain. And my thesis is basically this. I believe that science as a topic is shown to the public in a way that's somewhat elitist, and that researchers and reporters need to present their findings in more equitable ways. That's basically it. Sound good? Good. Let's get started. First things first, we have to establish what is science and make sure that we all have the same definition of it. Reason is, it's kind of hard to talk about the problems within a certain subject without knowing exactly what that subject is and all being at the same level. So of course, to find a definition, let's look at the dictionary. The Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines science as knowledge or a system of knowledge covering general truths or the operation of general laws, especially as obtained and tested through the scientific method, or as a department of systemized knowledge as an object of study, or as a system of method reconciling practical ends with scientific laws, or even as the state of knowing knowledge as distinguished from ignorance or misunderstanding. Is anybody else noticing a problem here? Science itself is such a broad and expansive field that there are multiple definitions of one word because of all of the different contexts it can apply to. For the sake of this video, we're going to try to create our own very general definition. It might seem like an oversimplification, but we can come back to that issue later. Trust me. So how do we create a definition for science? Well, we could use the definition that we already have, and we could look at a bit of science's history to understand it a bit more. We already know that science is a process. We use the scientific method to figure things out. That's the basis. However, I think there's a bit more to the equation than that, and I think a good place to start is with Thomas Kuhn. Thomas Kuhn was an American philosopher and wrote a book called Structure. In the book, he coined the term paradox paradigm shift, which changed the scientific community forever since then. There was an article that I read by David Kaiser that talks about Kuhn and all his work, so I'll link it down in below with all my other sources. But part of the article describes how paradigm shift is used to explain a certain cycle that science goes through as it evolves over time. A quote from the article says, A field of study matures by forming a paradigm a set of guiding concepts, theories, and methods on which most members of the relevant community agree. The article then explains how once the paradigm is set with those key principles, then science is conducted based around those principles and becomes more specific as research continues. However, the more and more deeper that researchers go into a specific field, the more they find unexpected findings and anomalies. These findings and anomalies don't match up with the original paradigm, and when it becomes too much, the people and researchers within that field have to reconsider consider everything that they started upon and change. That change is the paradigm shift, the shifting of the original principles that led the researchers to start at the beginning. Then the cycle continues, principles change, they evolve, and it just keeps going forever. I think this is a really good place to try to figure out how to define science, mainly because it does more than just objectively look at science as a process using the scientific method. It looks at science more as a mechanism that changes and evolves over time to adjust for certain things, similar to how society and laws change based on how things evolve over time. There there are so many different parts of science that there is never just one concrete version of it. It's always changing. So with all that in mind, here's our new definition for science. Science is the ever-evolving process of people trying to understand the observable world around them. Is that a bit general? Yes. A bit of an oversimplification as well? Also yes. But I think it's good that we now have a basis for what our definition of science is. That sound good? No? Well, it's my video, so we're gonna move on anyway. 
So, we have a definition of science. Now let's look at the problem I want to address. It's gonna be a bit hard to explain, but the issue I have with science is elitism. More specifically, how scientific language kind of creates a hierarchy based on who can understand and who can't understand it. And how that hierarchy creates rifts between people and society. Okay, so like, for example, have you ever been in a conversation with someone who uses words like perambulate or hegemony and just been like, or like you're in a class, but the teacher's just using terms that sound like they're speaking English, Russian, and an alien language all at once somehow. And I'll be honest, I don't know why this upsets me, but like when people talk smart to me, I get annoyed, and I know that other people sometimes get annoyed. I mean, the reason I picked this topic is because it came up so many times in the class that I'm doing this project for. I mean, one time we had a whole discussion because one of the things that we read used the word layman to refer to just common people, and that irked me a lot. It took a bit to figure out why, but like, I still had that knee-jerk reaction and I wasn't the only one with that. And sure, I'll just smack my lips and move on, but there are other people that when they hear stuff like that, they'll straight up just not believe you. And we'll get to more specific stuff like that in a minute, but I just wanted to figure out why that exists and how can we solve it. Now, I'm a college filmmaker, non-anthropologist, but I think I might see one of the sources that can contribute to this problem. That source being the position that science as a whole, along with scientists, hold over the world that we live in. We as a society rely on science to understand reality and solve a lot of the world's problems. But because of this, a lot of Western society sees science as this kind of objective truth with no possibility of bias or change. And yes, I'm aware that's a bit of a generalization, but it is a major issue. A lot of the time, we portray science as a very objective and uninfluenced source, even though there are things that could very easily change things in science, such as politics or money. And of course, there's the biggest influence of all, which is society and culture. I'm a pretty big believer in the idea that nothing is unbiased, and that in fact it's our biases that kind of help us push towards progress. However, it's also our biases that deter us from that progress at the same time. Another thing I read in class that has a good quote for this by Sandra Harding goes as follows. Cultures are toolboxes, not just prison houses, for the production of knowledge. Essentially stating how culture and society is one of the main influences into the study of science, the things that we study, the problems that we try to solve, but can also be a deterrent in the opposite direction. And if we try to present science as something that is just unaffected by all of these issues, well, it could probably lead to more problems than solutions. That's the problem I have, but I want to go into a bit more detail. In full honesty, I don't believe there's any way to change the biases within science. Like I said, I think everything has bias, and I don't believe that really to be an awful thing. The issue is that we present science as being unbiased. Not all of science can be correct because it contradicts itself too much, but it's those exact contradictions that cause so many issues. You see these issues come up in things like politics and social discourse. Anti-vaxxers, flat earthers, climate change deniers, all of this revolves around the same issue. That issue being our holier-than-thou presentation of science. And that presentation can lead to people rejecting it altogether. I have an example for this, so let's talk about climate change. Almost every scientific expert agrees climate change is an extreme issue that needs to be dealt with immediately. There's many in the general public that easily agree with that, so why are there people that also don't at all? Well, there's an article by Dan Kahan that actually explains this issue very well. In it, he says, social science suggests that citizens are culturally polarized because they are, in fact, too rational at filtering out information that would drive a wedge between themselves and their peers. Essentially, it's the fear of social implications of what you believe, which is very common throughout the world. Let's say you live in a place where climate change is generally not believed in. You can't really say that you do, because that could actually be a threat to you. The same way I might react negatively to someone using bigger words in a sentence, other people will react negatively based on the way you present your beliefs, and that's something that's really hard to change. I know it's kind of random, but I found a TikTok that explains it really well, so here it is. I'm secretly woke. I feel alive to not hate so much, and actually put out positive energy into the world. At least that's what I want to be doing. Oh, who is that? Just freeze, don't move. Uh, it's like a ty Tyrannosaurus Rex. If you don't move, they won't see you. Every time that they do the national anthem in football games, and then you see a couple people taking a knee. Why do you think I'm always taking a knee to, to tie my shoes? Because your shoes are untied? Nope, because I'm taking a knee. I'm so f***ing proud of you. I thought I was the only one. Sorry, I know the national anthem is, is happening right now, but I gotta tie my I'm shoes. I'm literally like this. I'm with you, Colin Kirkpatrick. I'm with it. It's Colin Kaepernick. It's Kaepernick. <laughs> I know it's a joke, but it still applies to a lot of real situations. So at the end of all of this, what do we have? 
We have science, an ever-changing process that is being presented as static and authoritative. We have negative reactions to that authoritative position, and that causes divisions between people. And even then, we have people unable to assign themselves to certain beliefs because of that division. So with all that in mind, what is my solution? Well, this video. Okay, let me explain. The whole point of this video and this project was to expand upon ideas that were talked about throughout my class. Literally, the assignment just tells me to make my own argument in relationship to the idea, then present that argument in some sort of creative way. I don't have to have an answer to all of this, but I do have an idea. That idea was this entire video. Since the thing I'm talking about is scientific language and how it's presented, I also have to look at how I present that information as well. So to whoever's watching, I just have a few questions. Did this video make sense to you? Did the layout of the video make sense and was everything understandable from one point to the other? Is the fact that this video is an assignment change your perspective on it? Would you have believed my points more if I hadn't told you this was a school assignment? Was it too general? Should I have gone into more detail about certain things? And lastly, do you feel comfortable just expressing these same ideas to anybody else or explaining it to anybody else? I'm asking this because I want to know, was this video a good way of presenting this type of information? I don't have the energy to go into the exact details of what will work and what won't, so I'm kind of just doing this trial by fire. Tell me what worked, and tell me what didn't. I really want people to be specific here because I really want to know this is a topic that I think is very interesting. I mean, if you couldn't tell from like the desk and the moving backgrounds, a lot of this was based off of Crash Course and other informational type shows on YouTube. All things I watched and that taught me things much better than a lot of my teachers could. And I think that's the thing that needs to adapt and change. I'm going on a tangent here, but just imagine a world where scientists, instead of writing out long papers and describing every little detail of their data, instead they did a video and showed it directly, using understandable language in the same way that freaking Bill Nye did. I don't know, it's not a perfect solution, but I think it's an idea to at least start with. Either that, or I could just be way over my head with this entire thing. But with that being said, I'm Elias of Elias Entertainment. Science can be annoying, but I think it's nice to talk about. I had a good time, and I hope you did too. Now let's hope I get a good grade. Alright, alright, let's go. 2023, new year, new failed plans. Let's get this going. Okay, first thing we got on the list is general topic that everyone's talking about right now that I'm definitely not two weeks late to. Alright, cool. Next, clickbaity thumbnail and title. All right, good, good. And lastly, let's see here. Uh, a host that is so seething with rage that he just sits there and vibrates the entire time. All right, good. Well, this looks like the makings of a great video. New Year's same problems, and I'm here to yell about them. And look, we all knew this was coming. Like, all the AI stuff that's been going around, eventually I was going to have to talk about it. And just to be completely transparent with you guys, I don't hate AI art. In fact, I think it's pretty cool. I really like it. The thing that gets me is how AR is used and developed and just... I'll get into more detail soon. The last video was very thought out, detailed, and calm, so this time I'm just gonna scream into my microphone and you're gonna listen to me. Mama Elias has her drink, so we're gonna get this started. Do the thing! First of all, if you're looking for someone to talk about AIR in a way that's like in-depth and very detailed and not repeating points that everybody else has said, you came to the wrong video. I'm just an angry person yelling into an echo chamber. If you want more detail, there are other videos for it. In fact, there are already great YouTube videos and video essays out there that talk in a lot of detail about all the issues encompassing AIR. I'll put those videos in the link below, but for now, I'm just going to talk about my thoughts. So first, let me explain what is AI art. We use this term very broadly, but actually it's a very specific thing. When I say AIR, I'm referencing things like DALI, Stable Diffusion, and Midjourney. Specific AI meant to generate art based off different prompts that a person can give it. Now, like I said before, as a concept, AI art, I don't hate it. I mean, artists, let's be for real for a quick second. We use AI all the time. AI is an integral part of being an artist these days. It's practically in every software that could be found. These types of advancements are meant to help the people within the field get better and more efficient at creating whatever they're creating. In fact, if you're a solo creator like me and you're having trouble with coming up ideas, you know that things like Mid Journey and Dolly are amazing for creating concept art and getting your ideas into a place where you can start creating. Now, all of that sounds very good for artists. If it wasn't used directly against us. 
The issue with tools like these when they're open to a public market is that they take away value from the people that actually create art. It's already pretty common knowledge that people these days have very low opinions of art. I wouldn't completely blame people though because this is much more of a systematic issue than an individual one. In the economy that America currently runs on, which is capitalism, art has a tendency to have a much lower value because it doesn't seem to serve a general purpose. Things like chairs, plates, phones, and computers all have purposes that they're meant to be used for. However, art doesn't have an exact use. Art has a much more emotional and cultural connection, so it's hard to put an exact value on that. And because there isn't a specific value, a lot of people believe that they can just place any value on art that they want, despite the fact that art is entirely subjective and everyone would have a different value system for it anyway. Now, I don't like the fact that things have to have value to be deemed important, but I'm not going to ignore the way the world works. Capitalism is based off of capital, and wherever the capital goes, the significance follows. Getting back to AI art, it's that movement of significance that's the big issue. We already know that if you want to struggle from meal to meal, then you should be an artist. But those issues get much worse when you start replacing actual artists with just AI clones. And when I say clones, I mean clones. Every artist references another artist. Everybody in our communities knows that ripping people off is kind of just part of the job. But a lot of us also know that there's a line to that. Hell, I won't lie, I go to ArtStation all the time just to take other people's color palettes. Then I just use that set of colors in my own work in some other way that I think is cool. What I don't do is just screenshot the colors, place them in the exact area, and just replicate the exact image. That's a problem that a lot of these AI are running into. Since it's just a code, it can't figure out exactly what is referencing and what is stealing. And because these AI don't know that, they end up legitimately just tracing and copying other people's artwork. If you're on Twitter, you've probably seen it. But some artists have found exact copies of their work in AI-generated images. I've also seen some really awful people saying things like, Well, if we could just generate the art, why do we need artists? Like the absolute f they are. And the thing is, there is an actual solution for this, but it has to do with how the AI art is generated in the first place. So the way AI art is made is very complicated, but I'll try to simplify it for this video. First things first, it's good to know that AI is just a code that is meant to learn. It goes through multiple revisions and tests, and it evolves over time. That's why AI algorithms like on YouTube and TikTok work so well, because they're learning based off people's behavior. And the more time a person spends with that AI, the more the AI gets to learn and gets to develop. But what's important is that AI needs something to learn off of. For things like TikTok, the AI learns off of what people like, what people view for a long time, and things like that. But for art, it's much different. What most developers of AI art do is that they collect a giant database of art that comes from the internet. They take these databases of art and then funnel it directly into the AI. The AI is also given a bunch of words connected to each art piece so then it can learn what correlates with what. Which in the end gives us the ability to type out a prompt, the AI uses that prompt to identify different sorts of art, and then combine it into a new thing. The big issue with this is that people are not consenting to giving their art to these AI. Now, I know a lot of people are gonna be like, well, if you didn't want to take it, then you shouldn't have posted it on the internet. And to people who think like that, I just have one thing to say to you. Who hurt you? And if no one did, it's gonna be me. Posting something on the internet is not consent for anything. No matter which way you see it from, taking people's work and then using that work as a basis for your own content and then selling that content is wrong. Considering these AI directly copy off of some parts of people's work, it's really immoral just to take those pieces of work and then sell it like it's your own. That's why things like copyright law exist, but they work very loosely in terms of the internet and specifically with new technology like this. However, the more this tech develops and grows and changes, the more it's gonna change the art field. Income, jobs, and even livelihoods will change because of this. And sadly, right now, it doesn't look like it's going for the better, so what do we do? My words may not mean much, but here's some ideas that could be thrown around. I'm a bit late to this topic, and because of that, I think a lot of artists have started to realize something. AI art is not a passing cash grab like NFTs or something. The technology's too good, and it's so good in its early stages that it's only just gonna get better from here on out. And because of that, I think a lot of artists understand that AI is here to stay. It's not going anywhere. It's going to develop, might get regulated eventually, and it's gonna change a hell of a lot, but it's still gonna stay. And with that, of course, there's gonna be people that misuse it and mistreat artists because of it because they want the money out of it. There will always be people out there that will undermine others' work for profit. It's just how it kinda is. However, that doesn't mean that we can't come up with ideas to still help artists and still develop things that work better for everyone. One idea that I don't know if other people have talked about is changing the way that AI sources its information. Instead of these AIs using resources directly from the internet and just taking them off without asking anybody, we instead create a database that people can collaborate with and give their art to. Like I said, there will always be people who try to undermine stuff like this, but even with that, I think it's important that we make something 
something that's collaborative, something that both artists and AI developers can contribute to and benefit from. The only issue with something like this is that it would take a lot of community work. Artists are not really known for having time, so it would be kind of difficult to collaborate and put something like this together. That doesn't make it impossible though. There were a bunch of artists that came together and started doing a boycott throughout ArtStation. If you don't know what ArtStation is, it's basically a website where people post their portfolios and a lot of their work. Honestly, if you want to see some amazing art, just go there. People post the most amazing work I've ever seen on that place. But recently, more AI art has come onto the platform and people really didn't like that. So there was a huge boycott of people posting images that looked like this and their own different styles and it was a really cool thing. But overall, the gist of what I'm trying to say is basically just treat artists better. Art and artists have a history of being manipulated by people trying to make money. And even when art is profitable, it's usually mass produced to a point where people get really tired of it really quick. I'm not saying that's much of a bad thing, but it is something that happens to make art profitable. But a good thing we could do is just support artists in different ways, individually. Yeah, it's a lot to ask, and since I'm an artist, it's kind of self-serving, but still. I'm fine with AI art. I'm fine with the idea that people use these references as a way to create new and interesting things just using code. What's not good is intentionally using other people's works to create your own profit. So please, if you can, go support any local artists or just any artist that you might find on Twitter or something. It's not even like you really have to send them money or buy anything from them. Like their video or post or comment on something that they've made. Boost their chances in the algorithm to get to someone that will pay for their services. That way we won't even have to worry about things like ARR because then will be supported in doing what we do best. So yeah, I know this video was a bit less organized than usual, and I'll get back to the more organized content, I just want to talk about this. So with that all out of the way, I've been Elias of Elias Entertainment, and this video is sponsored by No- No, psych, that's not actually what's happening here. I'm not sponsored, my channel's way too small for that. Instead, I just wanted to put a little ad here just to promote my new Twitch channel. I've streamed a few times already, and I don't know how much I'm going to be able to do it in the future, but it's something that I really enjoy and I think is fun, and I want to keep doing it somehow. You get to see lots of behind the scenes of how I create everything that I do on my channel, and it's really fun just to communicate with people. And since I don't get any ad revenue from these videos or anything, if you donate to me on Twitch, it's basically the best way to support me since I also don't have like a Patreon or anything like that. So yeah, I'll just do the outro one last time. I've been Elias of Elias Entertainment. AI isn't bad, but if you misuse it and steal other people's art, then I'm coming for you. Happy New Year! So, I had just watched Avatar for the first time, and I- Oh, dude, freaking love that show. It's one of, like, the best things I have ever seen in my entire life. Like, completely changed me as a kid. Like, really, like, helped just me grow, and, like, all these things. Ah, oh, it's, it's like such- No, 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 not that one. I, I mean the one with the blue people. Oh. Why? Over a decade ago, in 2009, the world kind of exploded when Avatar came out. It became the highest grossing movie of all time, and was critically acclaimed for its amazing visual effects and realism in terms of telling its story about blue aliens. That was 2009, it is now 2023, and I just went to see Avatar 2 The Way of Water. Before I get into the details of this video, I am just saying that this is all my opinion, this is just my thoughts on the movie and kind of a review of it, specifically from the perspective of a VFX artist. So whether you like it or you hate it, this is just just me giving my opinions and analysis on the movie. That's it. We good? We good. Now onto why I think Avatar's VFX ain't that really good. Do the thing! So yeah, basically, I went to see Avatar Way of Water so you don't have to. However, either way, it seems like everyone went to see it already because it already made so much money. Am I the only one that was confused by this? Like, I met no one that had actively went to see it other than like other filmmakers, and it just, it got so much money, I was like, where are these people coming from? I mean, as of recording this, Avatar 2 has made 2.1 billion dollars. I know only like three people who have seen this movie in theaters. But maybe that's just a me thing, maybe I don't hang out with enough Avatar fans, but either way that's not the point. I'm a VFX artist, so of course I'm here to talk about the VFX of Avatar. Now I already know that there's a bunch of people, specifically filmmakers, that get really touchy-feely when it comes to VFX. A lot of people think there's an over-reliance on CGI when it comes to filming, and on some level that's true, but a lot of the times it's just complaining for complaining's sake. I could make a whole separate video about that argument, but now I just want to focus specifically on the Avatar movies. I kind of want to dissect them a bit and maybe just go into what's good about the VFX and what honestly doesn't really work about the VFX, in my opinion. 
So without further ado, let's just start with my general opinions about this movie. So to be fair, I haven't seen the first Avatar in a very long time. I think I saw it in theaters when it originally came out, but since then I haven't seen anything related to it, and honestly I don't have any recollection of what happened in that movie. Thankfully enough, the second movie kind of recaps it for you, so I kind of got the gist of what was going on in the main characters and all that stuff. So after the end of the full three hours of movie, I had only one thing to say about it. That is... It's definitely a movie. It's hard to explain, just like, you know when there's something and it does exactly what it is, but like there's nothing more or nothing less about it? Like sometimes you just see a chair that's like so chair that like you can't say it's like a good chair or a bad chair, it's just like such a chair. That's how I felt about this movie, like it, I couldn't say anything really good about it, but I couldn't say anything bad about it at all, so I was like, it's totally a movie that exists, and that's about it. Legitimately, there were parts that I think were good about it, there were parts that I think were bad about it, but all the time it just felt like it was canceling each other out. Did I enjoy my time watching this movie? Absolutely, but I don't know if that would happen with anybody else other than me. Like I have no clue if I would suggest this movie to like any of my friends or anything because I feel like it's just such a movie in such a basic sense that like you can enjoy it, you might not, it really just probably depends on your mood in the day. Actually while I'm sitting here right now I probably can't remember about 70% of what happened in that movie, but there are scenes that I do remember very specifically and I'll probably hold on to for a very long time. It's the most 5 out of 10, yeah, I watched it, I enjoyed it, I wouldn't go back again though. So those are my thoughts about the movie as a whole, but let's get into the specifics and talk VFX. I'm a CG animator and VFX artist. If you didn't know that, then I suggest you look at the rest of this channel. I love studying visual effects and CG animation, as well as just understanding how it affects filmmaking and how it affects storytelling as a whole. In my opinion, visual effects is an inherent tool made for the purpose of storytelling. The use of visual effects is to do things that you yourself would not be able to do either because it's dangerous or not physically possible within a film. This connects to things like people doing stunts like holding off the side of a skyscraper or all the way to just creating full-on aliens and giant mechs or something like that. CG is just meant to do the things that we can't in camera and that's usually a really helpful tool. The entirety of the Marvel Cinematic Universe would not be able to exist without CG and visual effects. This goes for a lot of other movies like Inception, Matrix, and of course, Avatar. However, Avatar doesn't seem to have the same emotional strength or staying power like those other movies. So what's the difference considering that Avatar uses the most visual effects possible? I think the simple answer is, it's not using it correctly. Despite how good Avatar's VFX is, a lot of the time it falls by the wayside, people forget it, and it just doesn't become such an experience anymore. It's what happened to the first movie in 2009, and it seems to be happening with the second movie as well. I know y'all seen the memes about how Avatar is getting beaten by puss in boots in terms of how good of a movie people think it is. The Avatar movies are very sadly forgettable, so I want to kind of dig into exactly why that might be. Specifically, I'm going to give you a comparison, and just hear me out on this. I believe the 2019 movie Parasite uses VFX in a better way than Avatar 2 does. How does it do that? Well, let's get into it. In 2019, the movie Parasite came out, and it kind of shook the world for a little bit. When I watched it personally, it became one of my favorite movies ever. I freaking love that movie for so many different reasons. The story and characters are amazing. It's shot beautifully. It's just, ah, uh, I could talk about that film for so long. And something that people don't actually know about Parasite is around 50% of the movie is CGI. The reason why people don't know this is because Parasite uses invisible VFX, which is essentially visual effects that is not meant to be noticed. It's supposed to be seen as just a normal shot and nothing else. It's meant to trick the audience into actually thinking this was shot exactly like this and nothing was changed about it, even though it really was. The rich house that was the main centerpiece of the film? Yeah, the entire top half didn't exist. What about the alleyway that the main characters lived on and then got flooded? Well, guess what? It was a completely built set with blue screens behind it. So much of that movie was faked and it's so amazing because you can't notice any of it. Me as a VFX artist only could see one shot in that entire movie that looked slightly fake and even then I couldn't see exactly what about it was wrong to me. Seriously, if you're a VFX artist and want to understand the craft, watch Parasite and just try to find any mistake with 
any of the shots because you really can't. The reason I bring this up is because it's very similar to how I reacted to Avatar 2. Of course, I know that Pandora and the Navi don't exist, but the entire time I was watching that movie, I could not find anything that didn't look real. When I tell you, I was in that theater staring at that screen, not blinking for a second, and I could not find one thing that I could not believe was physically there. After a certain point in the movie, I just gave up on trying. I was just like, you know what, I'm just gonna try to enjoy what's going on in the story and forget about all the VFX stuff because it's just too real. And that was my actual mistake. You see, the difference between Parasite and Avatar is the way the visual effects services the story. Like I said before, VFX is a tool meant to tell stories that could not be told without them. Or you can do it physically, but it'd be much easier if it was CGI, which I know happens, people are on budgets, blah blah blah. For both the movies Avatar and Parasite, at a certain point, I could just not tell that it was VFX. To be fair with Avatar, I knew it was because I knew those things I was looking at weren't real, but at a certain point, I don't really care about that. Same with animation, I know that stuff doesn't care, but that doesn't mean I won't get invested in it because I love getting invested in animated characters. So at least for me, why is Parasite such more of a memorable movie than Avatar? The answer I think is that the VFX in Parasite services the story in a much more direct way. What I mean by this is that in Parasite, the people are the focus. I spend that entire movie looking at facial reactions and reading subtitles. I don't have time to even care about if something is CG or not. And since Bong Joon-ho is one of like the greatest directors and scriptwriters of our time, I was extremely invested in the story of Parasite, and that's why a lot of people love it, including me. It's a funny, witty, heartfelt, and pretty intense movie overall. It exposes things like economic class struggle and natural issues that affect people differently. Even going to things like what it feels like to rise through the ranks of society and what it feels like to have and just take those powers for yourself. Avatar, on the other hand, is a lot less about class struggle and a lot more about colonialism. And while inherently that's definitely not a bad concept to go off of, it just doesn't feel as real to me. The story overall is pretty simplistic. Jake Sully and his family are being targeted by the colonizers, so they have to escape. They flee to the Navi hidden in the water and they ask him for protection. After getting that protection, they proceed to have to kind of assimilate and learn the ways of water. This learning process spans most of the movie, so it's really just about finding that connection and finding your people a lot of the time. That is a theme I can totally get behind. However, even for a three hour movie, a lot of it almost feels rushed. We don't really learn too much about the Navi of the water and their customs and kind of what they do. The most we learn is that they kind of swim fast, they've learned to work with animals that are within the water to move quicker and traverse the water in better ways. Specifically, they seem to focus on the connection between the Navi people and the Tukun, basically big old whale aliens. This connection apparently lasts for life, but we don't really hear about it too much except for one character who kind of has like side missions with one of these Tukun. And I don't know, maybe it's just me, but a lot of the other information that was given to us throughout that story just kind of seemed unimportant. Like it seems significant to the world building, but not as significant to the characters who were just trying to learn things and assimilate properties so that they could work together. In Parasite, the visual effects is usually just set extension. Basically, they have big blue or green screens behind everyone and they use it to kind of fill out the background with stuff so it looks like a real place. Things like adding trees, elongating streets, all that type of stuff. For Parasite, these set extensions kind of act as a grounding for the rest of the story. For the story, we have to believe that this house has two floors instead of just one like it actually does. We need that because all the characters end up in different parts of the house and it's all meant to kind of really connect everything in one area. Same with streets and forests and those types of things. The alleyway where our main characters live is kind of extended past where it actually exists and that's used to kind of support okay this is a real place this is a real alleyway where these people live. Now to be fair to Avatar Parasite has a lot of sets that are physically built so that's already a really good step in the direction in terms of that realism and grounding. Avatar's VFX inherently has to do a whole lot more of the heavy lifting to make people believe that it's real. And the thing is, it does this perfectly. It absolutely makes people believe, yes, this is a real place. Yes, these are real things. What it doesn't do is describe or show at all why those things are important. And here's the thing, VFX can't explain why things are important. It simply exists. It's the story's purpose to do that. And I don't think Avatar explains these things well enough. World building is a hard thing to do, and if a character isn't invested 
interested in all the little details of the world, those little details will also be overlooked by the audience. An interesting thing is, I thought they were actually going to do this with one of the main characters. One of Jake Sully's children, Kitty, is really invested in the way of water and understanding how that all works and seems to be really connected to nature as a whole. However, this part of the story is kind of ignored a lot of the time. It only really comes to fruition at the end of the story when Kitty kind of has this magical connection with everything in the water that helps save the family in the end. Both movies seem to have this kind of issue where the themes are really focused upon but then it neglects the world and kind of our understanding of it. By this second movie, Jake Sully, who was once a man turned Navi, is supposed to be entirely assimilated with the Navi culture that lives in the trees. However, we don't really seem to learn much more about that culture than what we learned in the first movie. Instead, we kind of just focus on the conflict between the colonizers and the Navi at the time. And then, of course, Jake Sully and his family leave to a completely new place that we haven't experienced before that we also have to learn about. While, like I said, the movies aren't bad, they just focus so much more on the themes that the world is kind of neglected. This is the result, but this could have happened for a myriad of reasons. It could have happened from an over-reliance on CGI, which is probably a good part of it, to be honest. If there's any movie series that I would say relies on CGI too much, it's definitely Avatar. VFX is meant to depict things that we usually can't film, not describe anything to the audience. If you expect the CGI to tell your story at all, then it's not going to be a good story. World building can reinforce a lot of things, but it can't directly help with a story, especially within a film. That's also a bit of an issue. The medium where this takes place kinda also doesn't work with what it's trying to do. Avatar is an expansive, fabulous world that has lots of details that you could look into. However, because the characters don't look into it, we don't look into it, so we don't actually get to see a lot of that. But that's because it's a movie, and in a movie we follow the characters and what they're doing. If it was for, let's say, a game, then that could be a lot different. An example for this would be the game Subnautica, one of my favorite games of all time. Subnautica is a survival game that's set in an alien planet that is entirely ocean. In fact, its environment is very similar to the one that we see in Avatar Way of Water. The difference between the two is that in Subnautica, we actively interact with this environment constantly for hours. The entire point of the game is to explore, understand, and study this entire giant ecosystem. Avatar Way of Water is about also understanding ecosystems and understanding how people interact with those ecosystems. The difference is, we don't spend that much time with it, we don't interact with it as much. Instead, we interact with some cool animals, some weird things happen, the colonizers come, and then it gets all, you know, big battle-y. The issue with Avatar and its VFX is that it creates this giant, beautiful, and expansive world and then doesn't do anything for it. It instead focuses on some random colonizer that's then turned into an ally in his story. Honestly, I think Avatar could be a lot more interesting if we just focus it a lot more on the Navi perspective. If you're making a story about culture, about nature, about the world around you and interacting with it, you can't focus on the random military white guy. It makes the story interesting while you're there, while you're seeing it, but afterwards pretty forgettable. To summarize, just remember that VFX is a tool. It is nothing more than something to help storytelling. To me, visual effects can inherently make a story better, as long as you use it for that story. In terms of Parasite, the VFX ground us in a reality that we understand and that we can see, so that it can do a lot more things with what's going on around in the world. In Subnautica, its world is so detailed and so expansive that you spend all your time exploring it, sometimes even just ignoring the story for it because it's just that good. Honestly, I could make an entire another video on why Subnautica is inherently a better ocean alien world than what Avatar created. Comment down below if you want that, because I definitely want to talk about video games sometime soon. And also comment down below if you agree with me on these things, or if you think there's a different reason why Avatar kind of loses relevancy after a certain point of time. It's honestly an interesting thing to see something that gains so much money and becomes so popular immediately lose all that popularity within like a month or two later. So tell me your thoughts, we can discuss it, do whatever, you know, it'll be fun, nice conversation. Either way, I've been Elias of Elias Entertainment. VFX is an amazing tool, but you can't misuse it or else you'll end up with something like this. So good job, James Cameron. You made a movie. Again. Hey, Elias, um, the corporate's gonna need you to find the difference between these four images. So, uh, I'm just gonna leave these with you and, uh, you can tell me when you, uh, get all of them. Oh yeah, sure. No problem. I'll get right to that. They're all the same image. No, they f
ARN! I should really stop getting my video ideas from Twitter. But anyway, people have been talking about animated movies a lot recently, and I want to add my two cents into it. Especially with the new Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie coming out, a lot of people have been saying that animated films have kind of copied Spider-Verse. A lot of movies like Mitchells vs. the Machines, Puss in Boots, and Enter Galactic have been kind of called Spider-Verse copycats in the way that their art style and animation works, which I don't really get because it's just not true whatsoever. I mean, we can all have our opinions about art style, but I'm, I'm kind of trying to talk from an objective point. Like, these are not the same at all. So today we're going to talk about that, 2D versus 3D animation, and also why people who consume media are generally toxic sometimes. Do the thing! So why do people keep thinking that every other animated movie is a Spider-Verse clone? Well first let's look at what Spider-Verse did when it comes to animated movies. As you all probably know, Pixar and Disney have been ruling the animated sphere of media for like the last 20 years. For 2D animation, Disney was the undisputed champ, while on the other side with 3D animation, Pixar was ruling the world. When Disney bought Pixar, we could see an immediate change within the entirety of the animation industry, kind of following their lead in terms of animation style. This created a wave of movies that all had this same 3D cartoon cartoonish style that evolved slowly and not too much over the years. And of course, other companies like Sony and DreamWorks use similar styles to also follow in the footsteps of Disney. However, this is where I kind of want to make my first distinction. Ever since that Disney and Pixar merger, people have been saying that basically all animated companies are producing the same style of content. While all the stories are different and we can expect a lot of different things from different companies, the animation look all seemed to look the same to a lot of people. A lot of people called it the Pixar style because it was the one that Pixar basically created them. Themselves. However, I don't think this is entirely true. In fact, there were quite a few movies that pushed the boundaries and limitations of this animation style over and over again, and we don't really talk about it that much. Specifically, there's two movies I want to focus on that kind of did this before anybody else and that we don't fully talk about. Those two movies were Kung Fu Panda and The Lego Movie. First, to get out of the way since it's the easiest one, I think we all know what The Lego Movie did for the film industry. Even though The Lego Movie came out in 2014 when I was still a kid, yeah, The Lego Movie is almost a decade old. How do you feel about that? Even I I could tell that it was such a different movie. Since it came out before I knew anything about animation or CGI, I actually believe that it was just a fully stop motion animated movie like Coraline. I think the Lego movie was one of the first movies to really embellish itself into the medium that it was trying to represent. With its extremely realistic but also really expressive animation style, it made random Lego pieces and characters feel so real and so connected that the movie turned out to be an amazing success. The production of the movie also had a lot of technical advancements for the entire film film industry. People have heard me talk about it before, but the Aces color space was used in the Lego movie, and it really helped bring those really bright brights and really dark darks out to give it that really good realistic feel. I've been saying really a lot, but it's really good, so let's just move on to the next movie. I don't think a lot of people realize the absolute change that Kung Fu Panda brought to the animation industry. Each movie in that entire franchise had a different animation style for all the flashbacks and stuff that they would use throughout the movie. Combining that with its amazing choreography of its characters and honestly some of the best villains and honestly, all of media. Literally, I can go on for hours about how Tai Lung is a better version of Anakin Skywalker, but that, that's for a different video. Either way, what I'm saying is that both of these movies extremely pushed back against the regular style of animation that Pixar and Disney was doing. And I think it's because these movies pushed so many boundaries that we eventually got one of the best movies of all time that I can't wait to talk about. That's right, you knew it was happening. Let's talk Spider-Verse. Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse undoubtedly changed the entire animation industry. The unique animation style developed for the movie was deeply integrated with the actual medium that its story came from, to the point where Spider-Verse literally feels less like a 3D animated movie and more just like a moving comic book. When this movie came out, we got other movies like Ralph Breaks the Internet, Dr. Seuss's The Grinch, and Incredibles 2. We can debate if those movies are good or not, but there is a similar style that a lot of people attribute to each of those movies. While I do slightly agree, I can see the similarities that all come from completely different companies, which can feel kind of lazy in a Way. So of course, when people went out to see Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse, everyone was equally shocked and amazed. I mean, why do you think I call it one of the best movies of all time? Because of how amazing it was for the time that it was created in. Spider-Verse uniquely used its source material to create an entire world based around comics, and that world felt so integrated and so real to everyone who saw it that it just became an actual phenomenon within animation. That phenomenon led to other animation studios realizing they don't have to follow the Pixar.
Pixar model anymore. That the possibility for other animation styles to be used for more unique storytelling can and will be profitable. But that was back in 2018. At the time, it was very new and very exciting. Now, it seems we're falling back into the same problem. Or are we? Let's talk about the movies since Spider-Verse's release. Since Spider-Verse came out, we've had a wave of really good animated movies. Movies like this include Puss in Boots The Last Wish, Enter Galactic, and very recently a trailer is dropped for the new Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie, Mutant Mayhem. Now, if you look at all these side by side, it actually becomes much more difficult to discern what exactly is similar about all these movies. I'm not saying that they're not similar, because they definitely are, but when talking specifically with reference to Spider-Verse, what exactly do all of these four movies have in common. Honestly, the answer doesn't have an exact name yet, so I'm going to try to explain it the best way I can. You see, the similarity that I find between all these movies is something I like to call 2.5D animation. Before Spider-Verse, all the way when CG animation was first created, there was this idea to combine 3D work with 2D animation as well. This idea has evolved over the years, and we see it used in a lot of different ways. The way Spider-Verse uses these techniques is to create a lot of different effects related to comics as 2D animation designs on on top of 3D animation. Things like eyebrows and cheekbones are drawn in on top of 3D models of characters. This allows for a lot more of the 2D style of extreme expression that we're used to, along with the fluidity and ease of 3D animation. We can also see this in a lot of other media that was created around the same time as Spider-Verse. A good example is Arcane, which may not have came out the same time as Spider-Verse, but was in development around the same time. The animation for that show greatly relies on the fact that 2D animated effects are put in between and on top of 3D animation, sometimes even having 3D characters move around on 2D backgrounds. And if we really want to get into it, anime has been doing this for the past decade. Yeah, people may not like it, but CG animation and anime directly relates to a lot of this stuff. The combination of 2D and 3D animation is something that it greatly benefits from. If you want a really good example of this, then look no further than the amazingly animated Demon Slayer movie Mugen Train. The movie itself relies a lot more on 2D animation, but when the camera movements start getting a lot more confused, and the action scenes get a lot more intense, the CG becomes a lot more integral to a lot of what's going on. And honestly, it makes it some of the most beautiful stuff I've ever seen. All of this to say, the combination of 3D animation and 2D animation to create this new 2.5D style of animation is honestly an amazing thing. But it's also the only thing that's the actual similarity between all those four movies I said before. Beyond that, the movies are actually very different. Let me explain how. I think you can really see the differences between each of the films by looking at at the art style and how it directly was influenced by the story that it's creating. If we think about Puss in Boots The Last Wish, the movie has none of that comic book style that we were used to in Spider-Verse. The colors don't contrast as much, there's no curvy dots or anything like that, so we don't see a lot of what we know to be comic books type of animation. However, what we do see, at least to me, is something that looks a lot more like a fairy tale book. Watercolors that fade into each other, pastels that contrast each other but aren't too striking. Even some of the freeze frames and back backgrounds look like a piece of paper that was painted on, and much less like a printed comic book. And what about Enter Galactic? Well, there we also see a big difference. Sure, it's also about black main characters that live in New York, so there are going to be similarities in that respect. But in terms of art style, the lights and the colors are a lot more striking and different. To me, it looks like an artist painting from the Harlem Renaissance, just a giant collage of a bunch of different colors that are meant to depict a general image. If you look at these two movies based off their influences, and then look at Spider-Verse, you can see a lot of differences. Sure, both use 3D animation with a mix of 2D animation to create a kind of mixed style of sorts. However, the influences that brought them to that animation style are completely different and change a lot of what that animation looks like. Like, you wouldn't call the movies Kiki's Delivery Service and Your Name the same, right? Sure, they both use the anime art style, but because the stories they both tell are so very different, they draw and animate these characters in very different ways. Kind of like the same process, but different conclusion. This is actually the unique thing about art style. No matter what, even if you try to trace and copy another person's art style by hand, you will still end up adding a few of your own little trinkets and differences to it. Does that make it right to trace and copy work? No. However, if you're looking to someone else's work for reference and then using that to transform it into your own type of style and your own type of work, then you can get something that's actually yours and something that's actually very unique to you. The interesting thing about art in general is that everyone takes something from everyone else. It's just about how you use those things that you were influenced by, and those things that you create with those differences then influence other people, and that's how art is generally created. So now we know that all of these animated movies are not the exact same art style. 
So why am I still talking? Well, that's just because I have an actual important question for everybody watching and listening right now. Does it matter? I mean this in full seriousness. Why does it matter if movies look the same? Or in general, why does it matter if movies are similar in different respects? I notice a lot of people hating on the general animation style that Pixar and Disney had basically created themselves, and I got really confused. Like, guys, we all watched the same movies. They were good. Sure, Pixar movies have definitely a similar feel to them, but does that make them not unique on their own because of their stories? Like, look at the movies Soul and Up real quick. Soul and Up, animated by the same studio, both made me cry, both are extremely emotional and extremely heartfelt movies. But in what universe would you call them the exact same movie? And by what metric would you say that one is ripping off the other? Also might I ask, what is the difference between a cliche of a genre and ripping off someone else's work? If you're going beat through beat through a whole story just copying word for word someone else's script, then yeah, of course that's copying. But stories do have general formats, so what exactly is copying in that case? I don't know, maybe I just listened to a loud minority of people and got confused about what the actual issues were. I just know that when I see a movie and then see a movie that's similar with different characters and a few different types of story arcs, I'm perfectly fine with that. Not only am I fine, but I actually find that very enjoyable. An example I really like to use is the first Doctor Strange movie and the first Iron Man movie. I know we've completely departed from talking about animation, but just hear me out real quick. The film majors got a film major, let's just do this. I hear a lot of people hate on Marvel because they think that a lot of their movies are extremely similar. And here's the thing, I don't really argue that the movies are different because I know I'm not going to get through to people that way. I definitely respect that there are similarities between the movies, but the thing is, I'm pretty sure they're supposed to be. Is there an issue with the industry getting polluted by the exact same type of content? Yes. However, a lot of people forget that it's an industry. People are trying to make money, and they make money off of what people enjoy and go to the most. Are you telling me that if you made something that was not just really good, but also made you a lot of money, you wouldn't try to recreate that type of energy again? Especially when you can create the same type of project over and over again, each time with different characters that you created or different story ideas, that each would lend itself to that same type of project, changing it and giving it a bit of evolution each time. That's where we get to Doctor Strange and Iron Man. In terms of plot and characters, these movies are very similar, to the point where even both of the characters look very similar, like they both got the goatee and kind of like this constant scowl with the snarky remarks. However, there's one major difference between these two movies. Iron Man relies on technology, and Doctor Strange relies on magic. And are you telling me that after seeing the first Iron Man movie, you wouldn't want to go see Iron Man but with magic? It's a cool idea, you don't have to change much to make it be good. I think a lot of people, including other artists, see it as sort of lazy and uninspired that you could just take something you've already done and recreate it with slight differences. However, I think that gives a really good chance to explore story structure and explore your characters that you've created within that story and how those differences align with each other. This works really well for Marvel, so they can just keep pumping out the exact same type of movies with slight differences that will keep people entertained until they all come together and clash. I mean, if you want to talk about a broad sense, all the movies leading up to the first Avengers were generally very similar. Each had different characters and settings, but they all still had a main character that was some hunkly white guy that just wanted to do good. Each had a fatal flaw about him that they couldn't really overcome until someone else came in or they helped themselves get past it, and then they used what they learned in the third act of the story to defeat the bad guy. Look, I know this is a huge tangent, but I seriously don't fully understand it. Why do fans criticize media for copying itself, especially when the people who copy it were the original creators of that first thing? I've always enjoyed the same story but with slight differences in it, but maybe this is just a thing that either a small minority or maybe a lot of the public don't fully agree with. I don't know. Tell me your thoughts in the comment section or like hit me up on Twitter or something, you can do that too. Either way, please Please try not to put down art just because you think it looks similar. Even when people do similar things, finding those differences can be actually very interesting, and you can actually learn a lot about the artist from those differences. So try to enjoy it, there's no reason to really not like it, it's just media, it's entertainment. And speaking of entertainment, I've been Elias of Elias Entertainment. Animation and storytelling in general can be similar, it can be different, but who knows? Let's just try to enjoy it all. Now time for me to go rewatch the entirety of Kung Fu Panda. Right, baby, we're back, and guess who's got a few surprises for ya? I worked on this for a whole two hours yesterday, so I hope you appreciate it. Can we get a little drum roll for the announcement? Thank you, thank you very much. Yeah, that's right, that's good. Almost there, come on, come on. Uh, so yeah, I, um... 
I changed, I changed up a bit. Do you like it? I like it. I think the kind of Rugrats, you know, Peanuts drawn art style is pretty nice for this. Since it's basically been about a year since I actually made this little icon and that I've been using it this whole time, I decided to, you know, redesign it, make some more poses, give myself a bit more expression, except for, you know, adding an actual face. Don't worry, my head will say this blank sheet of paper for as long as I can keep it. So, you may be wondering, what on earth are we doing today? Well, I'm not really sure. All I know is that I wanted to make a video kind of just returning to my computer generated self. And also want to celebrate my new computer, which is actually just my old computer getting fixed because I don't know if you remember, that was kind of a big deal. <laughs> So we're just gonna have fun. I have some clips from a live stream that I did that I think are pretty funny that I'm gonna add into this video and some other things. So yeah, we're just gonna talk, discuss, and enjoy ourselves. Should I do the thing? I think I should do the thing. Do, do, do we, do we want to do the thing? I think we want to do the thing. Ready? Do the thing! I'm recording this on a separate day because I got lazy yesterday and just played Pokemon for a long time. Moving on, first thing we have to talk about is my new computer. As I said, it's just my old computer that's actually fixed and a little bit upgraded, but I'm gonna show it off for a little bit. The computer has actually been fixed for a while, but I just haven't had the chance to actually get to it and start working with it until just now. And of course, because of my excitement, I decided to record myself pulling it out of the box and getting everything set up. Are you ready for some absolute scraggly daggly buffoonery? Well then, here we go. So the first thing I had to do was get the computer out of the box, and for someone of my stature, that's actually a very difficult thing. You can see I'm just pointing out the Puget Systems logo, they're absolutely great, they're really good at just, you know, giving you good products, and they helped- Oh look, I knocked over the f camera already, I'm already great at this. Me a lot with fixing my computer, so yeah, they're awesome. Shout out to them, they're great. Honestly, I couldn't explain exactly what's happening in this clip, because truly, I don't even know what I was doing, I was just trying to figure out how on earth I could take the box out of the box, which had another box in it, and it was just- it was just all types of chaotic, you know? I'm really trying here. I mean, it's a great packaging method. I just, I'm just not smart. So getting everything like out and fully like in place was, was truly a hassle just because I'm, I'm not smart enough to, to do it correctly. God, I look like an idiot here. Please don't take this as a tutorial, guys. Like I'm, I'm not doing good at this. And I don't even think that's how you say the sentence. Like, look at this. This is, just, this is just me struggling with a giant heavy box that costs thousands of dollars, and I'm just... Yeah. Yeah, this makes sense. Well, hey, look at that. It's entirely unpackaged and looks perfectly fine. We did a good job, guys. I totally didn't break it already. I promise. I swear. Now, with that out of the way, it's time to set up our desk. The room was really messy, so I spent a lot of time trying to just organize where the monitors and stuff would be on the desk. You knocked over the f monitor, you f idiot so i'm just gonna speed right through this you know we can just get through this right here no need to look at that i do kind of go a bit crazy but you know it's okay my insanity is just breaking at every point during this video anyway so it doesn't really matter okay so now we're finally at the point of hooking everything up together I think I forgot a cord, give me a second. Okay, we found the cord we needed. So now it's time for the ultra amazing cord plugging in montage-ish thing kind of I do that to just run the thing. So all this started because I, because one day my computer would not turn on. Like you see this, this little button right here. Like I, I hit the button and, and nothing happens. So, oh Jesus Christ. Now we're back. Both the monitors seem to be working. Everything seems to be plugged in. Let's, let's see what happens. We want to, we want to see, we want to see this light turn on. Ready? Currently set to the recommendation. I don't care about that. It works. It works. There's something wrong with the resolution on the screen. I'm gonna go fix that. But whatever. Um, back to the time lapse.
I am really trying all the different types of editing strategies for this video. I just, I, I don't know, I'm just having fun with this one. But yeah, since you're seeing this video, obviously I finished setting up my computer and now I can make stuff again. So to celebrate that, I actually did a quick little live stream here on this YouTube channel. It was fun, I got to show off some of the projects that I was working on before my computer crashed. I mean, you could have been there and joined us, I don't know what you were doing, you know, maybe you have a life or something, but <laughs> I don't, so instead I just sit here on my computer talking into a microphone. This is an empty room. I I do nothing here. It is a void of emptyless souls that I'm screaming to right now. Can anybody hear me? I also had a full layout. I was able to talk to Chad and communicate with people and just what was going on. Even had a few moments where we just kind of went completely off topic and just looked up random things on the internet. It was a fun time. Here, I actually have a few clips from the stream that I wanted to show off. So enjoy this little segment of the video. Welcome, welcome. I hope you all enjoy uh, your time here. Hi, YouTube. Oh, fucking <laughs> God. Damn it. <laughs> and any any time, always gotta be hit it with the high YouTube. If you curse on streams, it hacks your computer and deletes your entire personality. Well, that's good. I never had a personality anyway, so it's perfectly fine. I can fabricate one from watching Mac Does It videos. Good morning, Butterscotch Ed. Honestly, that's a hard name. I, I Butterscotch Ed is such a is such a name. We're not all mentally six, some of us are 12. I'm a clean, I'd say you've matured a little bit. I'm a good 14. I think, like, I'm not, like, I'm not making poop jokes as much anymore. That was a whole lie. I completely do make poop jokes still. That was, that, I, I'm such a liar. Yeah, I'm, you know what, you know what, maybe, maybe I'm mentally, maybe I'm not 14. Maybe I'm just four. That's fine. Chat will continue doing the um, American Dad theme song as we go. That's gonna be great. This will be a good stress tester. This will actually be good. How did it load that fast? No, I'm d I'm dead serious. Uh, how did it? It did that so quick. It popped in so quickly. Hey, wait, it's doing it's doing this ridiculously fast. Actually, I know I know it looks like it's kind of trudging along, but this is this is this is our boy right here. This is the cyber spider. Oh my god! Wait, it runs. It played. It's playing back in real time. I'm I'm sorry. I know I know. Oh, that's crazy. That's actually insane. This is real time rendering of stylized animation, and I'm streaming, and it's my computer's not even like here up at all the fans aren't even going that much he's just he's just a, he's just a guy he's just a guy um with a cool spider suit and a cybernetic arm because he's cool this is what i mean when i say i don't finish projects i just see a file it's called the garden i have no clue what that means i open it up it's a camera and a wall oh oh i'm sorry i'm sorry i'm sorry three wall wall well i don't want to it's not about offending you it's about offending the, the youtube gods the youtube susan up there the susan would just be still on youtube i don't i don't know i i, I think i think i think she does i, I have no clue actually you know what we're gonna we're gonna do this we're gonna do this like another like an older live stream who needs blender where you can look up who owns youtube youtube is an american online video sharing platform of course just, just tell me who owns it. She's an executive officer of Google. Okay, that makes sense. Wait, 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 wait. I'm, no I'm noticing a thing. CEO of Alphabet and Google. What's Alphabet? Oh, so this is Google's parent company. I thought, I thought Google was the parent company. I didn't realize there was even like a higher up to that. I'm, I don't know why we turned into a business YouTube channel out of nowhere. List of mergers and acquisitions by Alphabet. Purchase of Motorola Mobility. Boston Dynamics, the dudes that make the the weird, like the AI dog things. I, I think, yeah, I think there's more to it. Deja News. No way that's an actual name. What, is, what am I, what am I learning here? I have no clue what's happening. Google acquired Dodgeball. Okay, what 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 is Dodgeball? It's a location-based social networking software provider uh, for mobile devices. Okay, that makes sense. Oh wait, there is a list. I'm stupid. There are so many genius labs. I feel like this is not what capitalism meant when they were like free market. I do. I don't think this was the intent. It's so many companies. We just hit 2010. We're at 75 different companies, and we just hit 2010. I, I found out what was what was burning. Uh, my father is making beans, and apparently he burned them. Apparently that's that's what's going on. Like my whole thing is just like I do it for the bit, and if it's not the bit, then damn, that sucks. Oh, you know what we can do? I'm gonna do an interesting little test. I'm going to open up my anomaly report folder. Was this the file? Let's see if I clicked the right folder. This 
was one of them. The reason why I made anomaly report, honestly, I made it because it was easy. It was not heavy on computers. Because what I could do was I could lower my resolution, and it would count because it's an analog horror series, so everything looks low quality anyway. So that's why I originally made this. Started making like analog horror videos was because it worked well for the computer I had at the time. Oh my god, all the textures are gone. <laughs> no! <laughs> I forgot all the textures would be miss- Oh, it's all pink! Oh Jesus, why is it- why is it rendering like that? Turn on optics. Boom. Oh my god, look how quick that is. Look how quick and sexy that is. Oh, yep, it's also all- <laughs> it's also all fucked up. You can tell which textures I, like, worked on in After Effects and made specifically. Because I spend all my time making random animations about some I don't even fully think out. Yeah, creating people that don't exist. It, it's actually- I'm pretty sure- it's a website. I believe it's called This Person Does- yeah, This Person Does Not Exist. Boom. It just generates a person that isn't real. And if you refresh the page, I believe it's a new person. Yup. <laughs> the fun thing is you can see the artifacts in the background. Yeah, it does get some really good details though. Honestly, I could just do this for a while. We, we. Not many black people. I could not stress this enough about like AI generation things. It is hard to find black people in these things. Yeah, I mean, hey, no, here's the thing about AI is that it absolutely can be racist because AI at a lot of times is based off its whatever it references. I believe this has actually happened once where if you use like chat rooms or social media to like have an AI reference as like a chat bot and then it became incredibly racist. I think that was a thing. Wait, let me, let me make sure I'm not talking about my booty hole here. <laughs> The thing about AI is that when it references human behavior, it, like, it's not going to question, like, what is right and wrong. It's just going to replicate what it's been told to learn off of. And if that thing is racist behavior, then it's going to repeat that. It's, I guess that, I guess that'll be it. I don't really know how to end off a stream or to start one or to do everything in between. I've been Elias of Elias Entertainment and, um, yeah, Ladybugs. To be fair, I also don't know how to end a YouTube video. But I hope you enjoyed the stream clips. I plan on streaming a bit more in the future, at least for the next like month and a half or so. So look forward to that. I also have a lot of videos planned. Now that I have my computer back, I just have so much that I want to do from Anomaly Report to Inside the Mind to even a bunch of little projects like reinventing Donnie the Ladybug as a live action animated thing. It's gonna be fun. I'm not really sure exactly where I'm going with this YouTube channel, but I think everyone's gonna like it and I definitely enjoy what I'm doing right now. So we'll see how it goes. So with that out of the way, I'm Elias of Elias Entertainment. I hope you enjoyed the video, and if my computer breaks again, then I'm definitely committing- Hello everybody, and welcome to my digital world! My name is Tumblr Sexy Man number 2537, and I just can't wait to show you all the raggy zaggy wacky adventures that me and my friends will put you on. But before that, I wanted to test the waters to see how you guys like me in our first pilot episode. So tell me, what do you think? <sighs> The rabbit. Excuse me? You heard me, buddy. Don't think you can try to skip me out on this one. Do you think you can make a digital character with that hip to shoulder ratio without me asking some questions? He's literally a rectangle. Up, 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 up. You're mine now. He's mine now. And that will never change. Oh, by the way, how much of your team can I harass online? I, wait, wait, what? So. You know why we're here. This video is going to be all my thoughts on the amazing digital circus. For once, I think I have a very specific set of credentials that actually apply to this certain topic. Like, I'm an animator, I'm terminally online, and also I'm studying for a film degree, so analyzing stuff like this is actually kind of what I'm supposed to do. Is there any way for me to turn this in for a grade? We're gonna analyze the animation, the writing, the storytelling, the possible hints for future things, the production, and of course, the fandom. The fandom in particular has become kind of a contentious issue when it comes to discussing Digital Circus, so I'm gonna throw my hand to the ring and see what happens. So of course, let's get into the show! Do the thing! All right, let's start this with my favorite category, animation. I think one of the few things the entirety of the internet agrees on is that the animators popped off for this entire goddamn pilot. The fluidity, the style, just everything about the animation in this entire show is beautiful. Personal props to the people who animated the Ragatha glitching out scene. Like the fact that it looks like she's genuinely just a 3D model that's breaking in the software, but it's still being animated in that way is just really cool to me. Also, can we just appreciate how anytime Kane is on screen, he's just so expressive despite, you know, 
being a mouth with eyes in it. Getting expression out of characters without human-like appearance is such a difficult thing to do, and I really love how they do it with Kane's, like, gum eyebrows. I don't, I don't know really how to explain it. The funny thing is that I actually was pretty unaware of Glitch Productions. Like, I knew of their show Murder Drones, but I hadn't actually watched it. But then I saw that Kevin Temmer actually did some shots on that show, and I got a bit interested in the production company. So, of course, when I saw him on the team for Amazing Digital Circus, I was like, okay, I gotta watch it, because I love his work, and I love his style of animation. Okay, last part that I'm gushing about, I swear. But I love the use of squash and stretch throughout the entirety of the pilot. While it's very normal to happen in 2D animation, in 3D it actually becomes a whole other the challenge. So the fact that they got all the characters to kind of run around and squash, stretch, and leap in such chaotic ways was just so good and it matched the theme of the show really well. Especially for such a small team of people, like, you gotta give them props for this. It's just really incredible work. Okay, I'm done gushing. Time to actually get critical of this stuff. Okay, time to talk about writing. The writing for this episode is pretty good in my opinion. Writing the pilot for a TV show is pretty difficult for most people. You gotta do things like set up the premise, set up the world, establish characters, and all this other stuff in a very short amount of time. Time. Honestly, I think it's a bit early to actually judge whether the writing is good or not because we haven't seen the rest of the actual story. We've only been introduced to what this world is. The only criticism I really have of the episode is that it felt like it was trying to do too much and somehow too little at the same time. Like, for this episode, there was the plot with Kane and the exit, Kofmo and his abstraction, Pomni being introduced to the world, and the whole Monster of the Week gloinks thing that happened. It felt like the story was trying to pack in as much mystery as it could for the fans so that people could get interested in it before the actual story really started. For me personally, that takes out a lot of the weight in the mystery and the curiosity and kind of doesn't let the story breathe in its own right. But also that might just be a me thing. This is a pilot and it could just be throwing things together so people will get interested and then it might remake the first episode so that it could be a lot more streamlined later. Or not, because it's a good episode either way, so I think that the creators should just do what they want to do. Next thing. I think more people need to talk about the editing of this episode because oh my god is it amazing. In animation, audio editing becomes a very specific and difficult thing to do, and I just think that they hit it out of the park with this one. That, combined with the stellar animation done by the entire cast, made this pilot just so much better and really took home the gold along with the animation. I mean, this is one of my favorite clips from the show, and it's just like, it encapsulates everything that I love about the audio editing mixed with the great voice acting. Do you like adventure? Activity? Wonder? Danger? Horror? Pain? Suffering? Pain? Disease? Angel food cake? Ow! YOU PARASITE! The wacky and zany sound effects mixing with like the dark and echoey space that is like the tent as like this looming force is really cool to me. And also because everyone knows that last scene with like the swell of the music and everything just mwah, on point. Of course my favorite editing bit was the part in the intro where it literally glitches out and repeats itself over and over. Such a small detail but such a great sign of like oh something is broken here. It's things like that that I just love about these types of indie productions that are just happy to kind of do whatever to make sure they get across the idea that they want. Okay, I'm gushing again. Moving on. The characters. Oh, do I have a lot to say about the characters. Let's go one by one, shall we? Pomni's an interesting protagonist. Her design is really cool, and I just loved her general panic state throughout the episode. She's really good stand-in for the viewer being like, what the hell is going on? But still seems to have enough of her own personality to kind of stand out as her own character. Even if a lot of that personality is just kind of being panicked. I don't know, I found it funny. B tier. Ragatha is also a pretty cool character. I like the fact that she's like a Raggedy Ann doll, but also like the mom of the group. I also like that her caring behavior is generally just another co- mechanism that she uses just to control whatever's going around in her life. Every character seems to have a different coping mechanism, and I like that they all have their own individual kind of thing that they're just going through. Also, B tier. Kinger is already my favorite character in this entire damn show. His delayed reaction screams are just so funny to me for no reason. I think it's a nest. But I also love his crazy man aesthetic, where he just kind of says random things, and I don't know, I find it enjoyable. He's the funny uncle, funny uncle character. A tier. Kane is also awesome. His expressive exaggeration mixed with his very intense anxiety at the same time is just such a cool mixture for a character. He really feels like a guy who's just trying to keep things together for everybody, and not just like this evil villain that I kind of expected him to be. It makes me a lot more interested in his character and personality, because it just makes me wonder, like, what on earth is he doing with this world, and like, why does he do what he does. S tier. Am I the only one who felt like I didn't really get much of Zubal? Not that I don't understand the character, more just like I didn't really get much time with them. I mean, their apathetic attitude 
Gertrude is obviously another coping mechanism similar to the other characters. But other than that, there's not much to the character that I really got, so I'm just kind of waiting to see what more there can be. Question mark tier? I'm gonna be honest, I forgot about Gangle. Which is weird, because I actually like the character. I think the comedy and tragedy mask kind of dictating the character's emotions is a pretty fun concept. I also love the character design, I think it's one of my favorite designs in the show, just because of how the ribbons like turn into a whole human body, like it's, it's cool. But yeah, I'm gonna be honest, I forgot this character existed. Plus, a lot of Gangle's character is kind of overshadowed by the fact that Jax is just bullying them the entire episode, so this is also kind of an undecided one. But I'm putting in an A anyway because I like the character design. <sighs> Do I have to talk about the rabbit? Look, I get it, everyone loves the mean rabbit, but like... I don't understand why. Don't get me wrong, I don't think Jax is a bad character. In fact, I actually really like how his character is mean, mainly because he's trying to have fun, but he's so bored he only gets it out of hurting people. It makes him kind of a small-time villain in the fact that, like, he's not antagonistic towards the plot, but he is antagonistic towards the characters, which can be fun. But on the other hand, he's just... he's just so rude. And again, that's fine for the character, but like, why would you like him after that? Like, he's so mean. He seems to kind of balance the line between a character that's meant to be hated and a character that's meant to be endearing because they're awful, and I don't know how I feel about that kind of balance. And I'll be honest, I kind of like his character design the least out of like the whole group, but I do enjoy his kind of 1920s animation era design. In fact, thinking about it now, Jax actually reminds me a lot of old Mickey Mouse cartoons, how the character was really just antagonistic to everyone around him, and while that is enjoyable, it's interesting to place that into an ensemble cast setting, so I don't know, we'll see how it goes. Find out next time on B Tier. Hey. I'm just putting this at this random point in the video because I just wanted to say thank you for watching. I hope you're enjoying the video so far and I hope you enjoy the rest of it. My channel is small but I try to put a lot of work into these videos because it is something that I really enjoy doing and something that, you know, I'm also currently studying so it's something that I'm very proud of. Getting to hear people's feedback on said videos and learning to try to make things better and testing out new things, it's really fun and I'm glad that you guys are kind of allowing me to do that in a fun and creative way. Anyway, I better stop stalling. Let's talk about the fandom. It's hard for me to add something to this conversation because this topic of fandom has kind of blown up along with the pilot that came out about a week or so ago. I mean, people went feral for this show, and there's obvious reasons why. I mean, I obviously like it a lot as well. However, the thing that was interesting was when the fandom kind of became aware that it was being created. Like, you could watch in real time how people were getting wary of what they were saying and doing because they were realizing, oh no, could we be a cringy fandom? A lot of people started comparing things to Welcome Home, another big internet series, and honestly, started getting scared. Anyone who's been on the internet for more than five years knows that fandoms have ups and downs no matter what's going on. The type of fandom doesn't usually matter, but we have a tendency to see this pattern happening a lot more with indie art and indie productions. I think this happens because a lot of indie stuff happens on the internet, and because of that, the internet kind of considers it its own. The internet is its place, and it needs to be kept in that space. By that I mean there's kind of a protectiveness over it. And this is normal. I don't want anyone to think that this is like a bad thing to happen. Fandoms naturally build off of creations. When groups of people find similar interests, they're naturally going to want to come together and discuss that because that's the most human thing that we can possibly do other than like eating and sleeping. Humans are communicators and fandom is one of the most expressive mediums for human communication that have existed since the dawn of the internet. However, there's nothing that can't be taken too far. There's examples of this happening in multiple different fandoms including Five Nights at Freddy's, Slenderman, Undertale, and way, way more. And people know this and are trying to learn from their past where they can say, hey, let's not do these things. Even the creator of the show, Gooseworks, has put out many statements trying to say, hey, don't do this stuff. Please be kind to each other. Even if some people don't like it or like something too much, that is okay. As long as we are not directly harming other people or wishing direct harm on other people. And forgive me for a moment, but I'm gonna kind of analyze this on multiple sides here. I'd like to preface this by saying this is a lot of my own experience coming into this theory, so it's not like any backed evidence. I could do a video on that, but that would have to be an entirely separate thing. So how does an extreme fandom form? Well, if you look at Digital Circus right now, you'll see one thing happening in particular. Right now, the the creation of three different sides of an argument are happening. One side praises the show for being amazing. The other side tries to critique the show, either in good faith or not. Either way, it embodies some type of negative connotation of the media. And then there's this third side, which is the middleman trying to say, hey, why don't we all get along? Because this is the internet, each side can get very verbose in how it defends its particular side. Even the middle people will have a tendency to get very agitated when two people are actually arguing about something entirely different and they 
they just want there to be peace, but then they get angry that there isn't peace, if that makes sense. It gets a lot more complicated than the way I'm explaining, but that's like the simplest version that I can put it in. I think each side have a tendency to try and push and pull at each other anytime there's an interaction on the internet. This brings in people to defend each side and kind of grows the popularity of whatever argument is going on. And because of the popularity of the argument, algorithms will push that argument up so more people within that fandom will see it and continue to argue about it. One thing that I frequently hear is, if you don't like it, why don't you just not interact with it? I never understood this argument because the point of media and the point of fandom is to interact and communicate. So why shouldn't someone voice their opinion when they see something they disagree with when it comes to that thing that they're interested in? I mean, hell, I'll call up Scorsese right now and argue with him about Marvel movies because that's what we do as consumers of media. The issue then comes when people start threatening others over this media that they enjoy and want to argue about. Again, because the way algorithms push violence and arguments to our faces constantly, we have this tendency to kind of get used to the idea of violence and wishing violence on others when we disagree with them. I think another thing that adds into this is the fact that art is so subjective that in the middle of an argument both sides can be right. You can have two separate interpretations of media that contradict each other and both be correct. I see this a lot happening when people try to dog on each other on places like TikTok and Twitter and say things like, oh you just lack media literacy or something like that. We get into the ad hominems and attacking the person more than we attack the argument because we don't really know what to do with such a subjective argument. This leads to fighting, aggression, and a lot of really negative things happening that, again, the algorithm will push up. Because let's be honest, instead of changing Twitter's name to X, we can just call it World Star with words. But all of this is to say, I actually have hope for this fandom. Yeah, I know, shocking, but hear me out real quick. This is one of the first fandoms I've seen that is so aware of itself. From the creator down to a lot of the people that contribute to the actual fandom itself, we all know what's going on. Many of us have been down this road before and we don't want to repeat the past. And while my solution isn't really simple, I think it is something that we can try. We, the digital circus community, should try to lead by example. From the creator down to people who just discovered the show, we should all try to express care and generosity to all the people that will join this fandom in the future. I know it sounds weird to say that considering I'm just talking about a show that only has one episode and just came out a week ago, but screw it, right? I'm interested in this. I see a lot of other people are also interested in it, so I think we should give it a chance. And I think we should also give the fandom a chance, even though it's also brand new. Let's have fun. Make fan art, fan songs, fan music videos, fan YouTube videos, fan animations, fan animatics, anything. Let's all just remember that behind all the screens are other people. Other people that are just as interested in this topic as you are. And that curiosity is something that we can all share. So with that, I've been Elias of Elias Entertainment. New art, new media, and new fandoms can be crazy, but I think we have a chance. So let's all go take a ride at the amazing digital circus. This, this is gonna be it. This is where my career as a creator, an artist, an animator, a critic, all dies before it even really got started. But you know what? I'm gonna commit. You saw the title. You saw the runtime for this video. And guess what? I'm gonna milk every goddamn ounce that I can proving my point. And after the fire fades, leaving this channel in ashes and ruin, a new world will be born from those ashes. And in that new world, I will finally have the chance to say, the 2010 Percy Jackson film is a better movie than the 2023 FNAF film. God, this is the worst idea I've ever had. Okay, like, I get it, I know. I'm fully aware of how crazy I sound right now, but please, for the love of God, hear me out. There is a logic here, I just have to get into it. It's hard to explain, but I promise you, there is a line of thinking here. Before I get into the details of this, I'm gonna preface everything by saying I am a huge fan of both these franchises. I've been reading the Percy Jackson series ever since I was a kid, and playing FNAF games at the same time as well. I've lived a lot of my two decades of life just inundated in the media related to these two franchises. I've played almost every FNAF game except for Pizzeria Simulator, and I've read all the Percy Jackson, Heroes of Olympus, and Kane Chronicles books. I have a deep history and love for both of these franchises. I promise I'm not trying to degrade either one by comparing these two adaptations, but I just want to talk about the mediums, how they work, and how adaptation works in general. I want to talk about fandom perception, I want to talk about headcanon, all these different things that come together in these two movies, and I think it's a pretty cool comparison. So let's just get into it. So without further ado, <sighs> let's do the thing.
This is the most film bro -y I will ever get on my channel, I promise. So let me go a bit more into detail about this issue. The reason why I'm comparing these two movies is to understand the art of adaptation, and how an adaptation separates itself from a movie. The reason why I chose the Percy Jackson movie and the FNAF movie is because one, views, and two, because they both show two very different ways of adapting media into film. And you know, I'm kind of a movie person. So the criteria I'm using for this is how each movie itself sits alone as a movie and how it sits alone as an adaptation, and then we'll combine those and see how they work together. I think by analyzing this, we can understand why some movies are hated more by general audiences or specific audiences, depending on what they did when it came to their adaptation. So let's start with the one that everyone hated. The Percy Jackson movie is bad. I don't think I'm raising any eyebrows by saying that statement. It's a pretty generally accepted truth. But here's the thing, why? There's a lot of issues you can point at in Fox's 2010 adaptation. It skips over major events that happen in the book, ages up the characters to suit the actors more than the story. It changes the style and look of many characters. The style of writing for the whole film almost completely ignores the general humor of the original story. And I can go on and on, but you see my point. There are a myriad of reasons for a fan of Percy Jackson and the Olympians to not like the Lightning Thief movie. The simplest way to say is that the film ignores the source material. In fact, the movie does this in such a way that it seems disrespectful to the original creation. And especially how Fox really planned to have Percy Jackson be a franchise, it seemed a lot more like a petty cash grab than any meaningful adaptation. Okay, now this is the part where I need you to stick with me. However, let's pretend you have never read or even interacted with Percy Jackson as a piece of media. Never touched a book, any of the graphic novels, not even seen a piece of artwork on Instagram. If you as this person walked into the Percy Jackson and the Lightning Thief movie, what do you think you would come out with? What would that reaction be if you weren't a fan? The interesting thing is, from most of the people that I've talked to about this, the reaction is essentially this. Eh, it was okay. Which is mind-boggling to a lot of people. How can it be enjoyable when there's so many missteps and errors about the entire film for a whole two straight hours? Well, let's try to look at the film from the outside. If you don't know that Percy Jackson and every other character is supposed to be around the age of 12, then you wouldn't question it walking into the film. If you don't know that there's an entire part of the story that takes place in St. Louis that's entirely cut out, then you wouldn't question it when viewing. Because despite how much the film takes away from the original source material, it does have a cohesive plot. Percy still finds out he's a demigod, he still gets framed for stealing the Master Bolt, he still finds it in his shield at Hades, and still returns it. Is it bare bones and kind of lifeless? Yeah, but is it still a story? Yeah. And here's the thing, while the movie is still bad in my opinion, I think there are a few scenes that I think actually deserve some praise. There's a few moments in the film where the energy from the Percy Jackson books actually seeps in, and it's really fun when that happens. Like the, this is a pen scene is really great to me, and you can see where once the writing and energy is right, then the movie actually does seem good. Hell, as a VFX artist, I can still appreciate a lot of the animation and work that was done on a lot of the monsters. I'll say it, I think Medusa looked really good in that movie, even if the tension and action from that scene was completely taken out for some reason. I'll also admit that the film had such bad pacing and flow that it really threw its energy everywhere. Like, it's not Spider-Verse, but it's also not Grown Ups, if you understand what I mean. It has a cohesive plot with actors that work if you don't know the characters and comedy that lands sometimes. So at the end of the day, I'd say that the Percy Jackson film made in 2010 is a decent movie, but a horrible adaptation. So now let's see what happens when you reverse those roles. I'm gonna say this once, please understand it is my opinion. However, the Five Nights at Freddy's game storyline sucks. Ignoring the movie, the books, all that type of stuff, the actual plot line that we can understand from the lore of the game is awful. Or at least to me, it is told and expressed in a really bad way. Look, I love lore videos and game theory as much as the next person. However, this, this, and this is not how you tell a story. I made this claim a while back and got a bunch of comments telling me that I was wrong, which really confused me. I thought we knew this. I thought the thing that was fun about lore dumping and studying through all of the different parts of the FNAF games was the process of studying through and ripping apart its pieces. Going through the puzzles and understanding all the different things that lead you to the final answer and getting that release of finally getting to the end. You know, the kind of maybe FNAF was the journey along the way type of thing. Let's be honest here, guys. 
This story is whack. If any of you guys have seen the multiple part series that MatPat did on the full FNAF timeline, you'd kind of know what I'm talking about. The dude had to embellish so many details about the story because a lot of it was still unknown. Parts of a story that were really important and made it a lot more interesting. I loved that video, but I knew that a lot of what MatPat was adding just wasn't part of what we knew. And also there's a million videos about how MatPat can be wrong on things, so we don't even know if the things that we're sure about, we're sure about. Like, for example, I want people in the comments to tell me, in a succinct, direct answer, why William Afton kills the first child. Seriously, do we ever get a motive? Is this something that I've missed over the past, like, decade of this game existing? And look, it's fine if we don't have, like, a realistic murder. This is a story about ghost kids and magic goo. I don't need it to be realistic. I just want something. Is it just because he's evil? Because we've never been told or even shown that Michael Afton is evil other than the fact he just kills people. What leads him to do it? Matt Pat concludes that it's competition with Henry Emily, but... We don't know this! There are differences between guesses and theories, and a lot of FNAF is filled with guesses and not just theories. We have to fill in the blanks from the blanks that we are filling in because so much of it is not told. So then when it comes to a story, it makes it very difficult to create something that people actually enjoy and understand. And remember, FNAF was supposed to be Scott's final game until he moved away from game development altogether. None of this was planned out, which, to be fair, created a great feedback loop between creator and audience. But that also leads to a lot of retconning, a lot of changing of details, a lot of misunderstandings and incoherence. And maybe this is just a me thing, but to me, an incoherent story is a bad one. Hell, that's why I ended my Analog Horror series. I knew the story was too convoluted and I needed to tell it a different way. I tried retelling it over and over again, but nothing worked, so I decided to table it for now and maybe come back to it later. So with all that in mind, is the FNAF movie a good story? The answer? God no! If you try to walk in and understand the FNAF story these days, it is inherently so confusing that it is almost hostile to audiences. It's why explaining FNAF lore to people who don't understand it is such an impossible task. Heck, I'm still watching this freaking 9 hour video that tries to go through everything, and it still skips over some details. And here's something I'll admit, the movie did a really good job of succinctly placing different parts of the FNAF lore into a general plot. However, if you don't know this lore if you don't know any context of the story, none of it makes sense. Then it just looks like an entire movie of cheap jump scares, ploys, and underdeveloped characters. Now I know what you're saying, I know what you're thinking, trust me I already got it. I am fully aware that the FNAF movie was not intended to be enjoyed by general audiences. The creators of the film and Scott himself all came together and said this is a movie for the entertainment of the fans and no one else. And that is perfectly fine doesn't make it any less of a bad story though. The events in the FNAF movie to me feel a lot more like the re-establishing of a new canon. Basically separating the movies from the games and the books as a different universe where this is the understanding of how things happened. Which is fine, but if this is a kind of reset of the FNAF universe to be told in movie format, you could have told it more succinctly. Why on earth is Golden Freddy evil? Is he like the vengeful spirit that we know of Cassidy? Is he not? How should we know? We had no clue. There's no answers. Does the cupcake have its own soul? Is it separate from Chica? I don't know. Why does Bonnie look like he's zooted out of his goddamn mind throughout the entire film? The issue I have is that I don't trust the storytellers to not continue with the cryptic messaging that FNAF has always went through. And while in games where you can interact with the world around you, that's more than okay because we can actually try to find all the secrets ourselves. But in film, we have a lot less of that interactability, a lot less of that autonomy. So I worry that secrets will be kept from us, but we won't have the ability to interact enough to find the answers. We'll be stuck in the same loop that we've always been with the games, except we'll have less control and less ability over what we understand. Maybe it's just my own fatigue from the series, but I feel like that will just be less entertaining in general. However, if you are a fan, then this is one of the greatest movies of all time. And do I know it, Jesus Christ, I love this film. I love the campy nature and style of it, the amazingly made animatronics, and the great puppetry done by the team behind the film. The acting is honestly top notch, and of course Matthew Lillard is a god in this whole thing. Let's be honest, he's gonna carry this franchise on his back for the next, like, five years. The different cameos of YouTubers is really great, even if Matt Pat f tricked me. I will never forgive you for that, Matthew. And hopefully the king! 
of Fruits of the Betty will be able to make an appearance in the next one. All these things are truly great, and if you are a fan of the series, makes the film one of the most rewarding experiences I've ever had in a theater. Honestly, hearing the living tombstone at the end credits of the movie gave me the same cathartic release as hearing On Your Left in Endgame. It's just that great reward after so much time enjoying a franchise and finally getting to see it on the big screen. It's obvious that the creators along with Scott Cawthon really tried their best to make this movie for the fans and understood exactly what we wanted. We wanted joyful campiness. We wanted ridiculous comedy. We wanted childlike whimsy and horrific murder. And we wanted all of that packaged along with a few Easter eggs along the way. While the story may be incoherent, it doesn't make it any less of an enjoyable film. I like it to Spy Kids where it's such a fun movie to watch but makes so little sense if you actually think about it for more than two seconds. And that's not a bad thing, that's an enjoyable film, it's just a different type of it. So at the end of the day again, I'd say that the FNAF movie is a bad movie but an amazing adaptation. So film versus adaption. By now you might have noticed that you can have one or the other but it's very difficult to have both. It's also very difficult to have neither, but that's definitely possible. Moving a story from one medium to another is a complicated task. If you're doing a book to a movie, a song to a play, anything like that, it's really difficult to fully encapsulate every detail because the medium is built to exist within that space. Changing that medium means changing how that story is expressed and changing how people view and understand it. The PGO and FNAF films are good examples of one or the other, but what happens when you do all or neither? In my opinion, one of the best adaptations and general stories ever put to the screen is the Game of Thrones series. I know translating things to TV is different than translating the film, but I'm making generalizations here. It's pretty well known that the Game of Thrones TV show not only stays very heartfelt to its source material, but is also one of the greatest shows of all time. Except for season eight, people people don't like that part, but uh, we are gonna talk about that. The Game of Thrones books are massive in storytelling and plot, and yes, that story had to be changed a little bit when developing it into a TV show. However, by using the filmmaking tools of perspective and focusing in on certain characters, the filmmakers were able to stay close to the source material while fitting the story into a different medium. Let's be honest, reading Game of Thrones and watching Game of Thrones are two completely different experiences. While you're definitely seeing the same characters in the same events, you feel like you're visioning them in different ways. That's using adaptation to its best benefit, changing how the viewer perceives the world that they're enjoying. By doing this, the adaptation becomes part of the media's culture. A version of the story that some people may like more, some people may like less, but everyone enjoys together. Now let's talk about what happens when you do the exact opposite of that. Drum roll, please. <laughs> <laughs> That's right kids, we're talking about Avatar. This movie sucks. Not in the way the Percy Jackson movie sucks, and not in the way that the FNAF movie sucks. This movie is bad in every single possible way. This film directly disrespects its source material. We know this because the creators literally left the production. Imagine how rude your recreation of something has to be for the creators to actively dismiss it and walk away. I don't know, let's ask the Percy Jackson movie since it happened to them too. However, I do want to define a difference between these two films. Despite all of its myths and magic, the Percy Jackson movie does have a cohesive, slightly realistic plot. There is a problem. Percy is framed for said problem. Percy has to stop himself from getting framed from said problem. However, M. Night Shyamalan's Avatar The Last Airbender tries to wrap an entire season's worth of problems into a single movie. This not only cuts out a majority of the story and a lot of the character development, but also then gets rid of any semblance of a cohesive story. The characters have less motive to do anything than Purple Guy, the actions they then take have no reason for happening, and then the actual plot points of the movie feel like a random string of events that have no correlation whatsoever. Whatsoever. And since a lot of the story is taken away, they literally don't have any correlation. It's just incoherent. This is what I was talking about with the original FNAF story as well. When your story is incoherent and you don't have motivation or understanding of why characters have actions, then you don't have a good story, even when it comes to Avatar where they have all the story already done for them. At least with the FNAF movie, I can give an exception with the fact that the story makes absolutely no sense from the games. What's Avatar The Last Airbender's excuse? Nothing. 
It's just bad and lazy. And look, I'm stomping on a dead horse's grave here, but still. The Avatar The Last Airbender film is not just incohesive from a story's perspective, but also an adaptation perspective. It ignores both these sides and tries to throw in as much fan service as it can for what the Avatar franchise is. However, the creators of the film didn't understand that the thing that appeals people to the Avatar The Last Airbender franchise is not just the bending and the world, but the story that happens throughout it. In the FNAF movie, the appeal is the style, the animatronics, the horror, the giggles, whatever. While the story is definitely a facet of it, it is not the entire creation. For Percy Jackson, the story is the main draw of it, however, at least the creators got some semblance of a plot out of their messed up characterization of the original source material. But this? This is just a mess. A misguided, underutilized mess of a cash grab. And I agree, this thing should have never been made in the first place. But it was. So what can we learn from it? One of the first things we can learn from this is trust the creator. This isn't really for the audience and a lot more for movie studios who don't really understand how to do an adaptation because God knows there are way more examples than the ones I put in this video. But these studios really need to understand that they can't go through with a project if the creator does not sign off on it. Because every time a creator quits an adaptation, it goes so horribly. I think Hollywood's slightly learning its lesson these days, but still. Trust the people that created the source material that made it so popular in the first place. They will usually understand things more than anybody else. And then sometimes you have JK Rowling, which you just need to throw in the trash and forget that they exist. Lesson number two we can learn is that adaptations will always change something. If we we as fans want an adaptation of a certain story into a different medium, then we have to accept that it will be different. I know most people actually know this, but I still want to talk to the people who have a hard time fully getting this part, cause like, come on guys. We gotta let Percy be blonde, like we just have to let it happen, go through the motions, I know it'll be difficult, but it's okay, we can push through this together. I understand that people are really protective over the media that they enjoy, but sometimes when things change that can allow us to perceive them in a different perspective. I think we should let our stories change, evolve, and become new things as they grow. Yes, the original Percy Jackson film was a bad adaptation. However, I do know a lot of people that got into Percy Jackson through watching that movie. Yeah, they learned that the movie was a horrible remake of the book, but they really liked the book, and that's how they learned about it. It's a good way to get people to enjoy a new type of media, and I think it's worth trying, even if we really mess it up sometimes. Except for you, Shyamalan. You, you're not allowed to do that anymore. Lesson number three, understand your audience. This is where the FNAF film excels. If anything, that movie is great at fan service. It provides that cathartic experience that people really want from putting all they have into a media for so long. That catharsis and energy that you feel sitting in a theater with a bunch of other people that have watched the same 70 MatPat videos as you have is really something special. It's a community, a family, if you want to be cringy. We are FNAF. That type of companionship and familiarity that comes from going through the same experiences together. The FNAF film knows this and leans into all it can as much as it can and does it in a really good way. I think we as well as all other adaptations can learn from that and maybe adaptations in the future will think about their fans just as much as they think about the source material and the money. God this video is long. I'm recording this before I leave for Thanksgiving break so that means I'm gonna have to edit it when I get back and honestly I am not looking forward to dealing with all of this audio. God I think I talk about FNAF for like five minutes straight. Oh well, you can tell that I'm pretty interested in subjects like this. So let me know if you want to hear me talk about stuff like this again, or if I should just shut up and keep making Pokemon animations. I do really like making the Pokemon animations, it's fun. But either way, that's all I got for this video. I've been Elias of Elias Entertainment. I love these stories, and I hope that they can be treated well in the future. Sure, there will be mistakes, but who knows, we might get something really cool out of it. Until then, we'll just have to see what Netflix has to offer. God, am I the only one that does not trust that trailer? Anyway, bye!